Okay, let's start the show. For Thursday, March 5th, 2020, welcome to This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested.com. Only your test. Sing Welcome. It. Sing it, Norm. Absolutely. Welcome to this special episode. No, it's not special. It was going to be special, this episode. <laughs> not special? <sighs> Every episode is I special, feel. Jeremy Williams. It's very special. This is a duo cast cast now. This is just what we do here. Wow. Is it? No, I refuse to believe it. It's the new normal. It, well, if you're watching the video, you can see it's just Jeremy and I on the podcast. I was hoping... That Kishore could be here. He could not. He's out of office. Mm -hmm. uh, but we may have him check in in a little bit. Um, via satellite. Via satellite, of course. But I was hoping to have every, all of us in today for uh, talking about the 10th anniversary of testing. Oh, I too. I too. I didn't know. I didn't know. I would no, have brought no, you a gift. No one knew. <laughs> Who remembers? <laughs> Are you making a thing of it on the website, on no. the YouTube channel? No. I mean, I was thinking about it over the weekend and... I, I tweeted about it last week, or maybe it was over the weekend. Yeah. But uh, that oh my gosh, it's like it's it's, it's been ten years, and it just popped in my head because it, when we started in March, twenty ten, and then Will reminded me it was March eighth, twenty ten. So you know, that would be a Sunday, I want to say this year. Has, he didn't know that though, right? I'm I'm sure Will knew that. Really? I'm I'm sure. Wow. I'm sure it's it's ingrained. You know, if you go back to uh, the if you go on tested.com and you look at our blog posts and you go to the very, very back of the archive. This is possible? It's possible, absolutely. If you wow. go to the very first few posts, mm -hmm. uh, the first post is on March 4th not, okay. mar and, mar and not March 8th. And that's oh, because- Pre-launch post. We, exactly. We were already working on the site and doing some, putting up some content and putting it- um, uh, backlogging it, uh, not backlogging it, but uh, building up a backlog, I guess, before we launched that so there would be things for people to read and look at. But March 8th is when we launched officially, when we dropped our first video. Do you remember what the first video was? Was it uh, slow motion balloon throwing? No, I, no, that was like, like at least a year and a half or huh. two years in. I have no idea. What was uh, it? it was flip phones in condoms using them as underwater... Uh, protectors really yeah tested tested this is what we do that's a, that, that that was the idea jeremy <laughs> wow oh my god i went to page 100 and i'm only in 2018 so yeah it goes back are you pretty sure far. that's page 100 well yeah did p equals 100 you want to do p equals a thousand maybe where does that take us that takes us to 2011. Oh, you're close. Yeah, it's getting oh, back Oh there. my God, there's a lot of stuff. <laughs> Holy smokes. <laughs> I promise also a lot of people who, are, uh, who listen to the podcast, because this is still a podcast, that we would um, dwell less on the video aspect. I'm really glad we have oh, this right. giant Sorry. TV behind us that we can use to do things like FaceTime our friends in and do remote dial-ins and to just put up some media to reference the things we're talking about. But it's really the audio listener Love you too, YouTube viewers, but the audio listeners mm -hmm. who um, who support the podcast. It's true. And, and the video listeners, uh, they just complain about the big microphones in our face. Exactly. And the, it's all for the audio listeners. It's all for the audio. That's right. Exactly. Right, right. You know, most people who probably watch it on YouTube probably just put it on the background and listen to the audio. Yep. So long way of saying, let's not dwell on the imagery, but 10 years of testing. Also, so... We're not doing a big thing because when we think of anniversaries, it's tested had had so many has have had so many uh, iterations. You know, you could count tested from when we started our YouTube channel, which was not in 2010. We didn't have a YouTube channel properly mm -hmm. in, in 2010. We didn't have a YouTube channel until really after we started working with Adam in 2012. And so, like 2012 was like really when you when you can think of it as. Um, one of the ways you can think of the milestone of when you know the current version of Tested started, and also okay. a bunch of different milestones. Well, congratulations, Norman Chan. It's been, you'd think you'd be doing, 
if you do anything for 10 years, you think you'd be good at it. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I took away from thinking about it this weekend is that, boy, we're still figuring things out. Uh, maybe you've always been good at it. No, just still, still figuring. Definitely not always been good at it. You look at that <laughs> stuff back then, definitely not. That, uh, that, that first video, flip phone, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, condoms. In condoms, jumping into a pool. Mm -hmm. I'll give you some behind the scenes. That was a two and a half minute video, first of all. That's how little on a proprietary video player on Ouch. in the Whiskey Media Network. Yeah. Right. When we were still working with our, our friends at Giant Bomb and, and Comic Vine. Paying for uh, video uploads. Paying. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And, and, <laughs> and hosting. Right. Uh, and, and, and it was two cameras. It was that video was shot in, I believe, uh, the backyard of the general manager of Whiskey Media, Mike Tatum back then, mm -hmm. uh, in his, uh, his pool. Uh, Vinny Caravella shot that along with Joey. It was the first time I met Joey. Really? That, uh, was, on that shoot? Was on that shoot. How about that? Uh, two cameras. And what I'm wearing in that video, we can still, it's on YouTube. We did eventually upload it there, is a costume of an old timey swimsuit that I got from like Costumes on Hate, which was a <laughs> costume swimsuit, not an actual swimsuit. So it just soaked up water oh. and it was real heavy. Oh, yuck. It was gross. Yeah. But put those goggles on, held up those flip phones, jumped in the pool and recorded some video. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Norm, congratulations. I know. Top story this week. Podcast isn't canceled. No, I was just admiring that they had GDC in 2011 at uh, on your old blog. Oh. Yeah. Ooh. So our top story this week is uh, talking about all the things that have been canceled this past week. Any surprise here? I was I was holding out hope. I don't know. I, at this point, you know, it's not so much a surprise. We'd already seen some cancellations. Uh, but there were some big ones this week, especially GDC for in our right in our own backyard. Yeah. So over, in the past seven days, things, events in our sphere, things that we would have followed or even attended that have events that have been canceled uh, out of an abundance of caution uh, include the Game Developers Conference, mm -hmm. and that was in uh, following um, sponsors and um, exhibitors pulling out right right so uh microsoft ea sony uh facebook all said they would not participate they would be running remote events and and stream so gdc unfortunately it not only, well it's not exactly canceled but what the organizer said is that they would be having it sometime later this year postponed postponed which is I, i'm glad that that's what they're doing because yeah. one i love gdc it's a local event um it's a great place to see we'll see if that developers. actually pans out though because that's, yeah. that's asking a lot of, it is. of the world of game developers to you know set aside time later at an unknown date in the in the year yep and then make new travel plans and arrange to be together and i mean it, it, that said it's an important event to them it is an important event to a lot of um smaller developers uh, for big companies i think it's a also a big ask to ask them to realign their announcement plans and their releases. Oh, sure. Uh, that's going to have those things are going to happen regardless. It's a networking event, though, for yeah. most people, yeah. just to get together. Yeah, yeah, and and for, for that, that we absolutely want that event. And it's like not like GDC only happens in San Francisco. They have other GDC mm. events in in Austin. Um, there are other big game development events as well. But so, but I do hope that that's something that they will be able to manage doing uh, and getting those sponsors back and getting the exhibitors back because as an organization, these these big convention companies, you know, not a lot of people know, but they're not all just flush with cash. They can't just say cancel an event and, and just chalk it up as, oh, you know, too bad, we're just gonna look to the next one. Uh, it could disrupt the organization. Yeah. <laughs> and um, we don't know what the health of these organizations are. Yeah, well, the they're cutting their losses because it, it, these are the, the cancellations are due to coronavirus concerns, and they can't afford to have their staff absolutely sick for for two weeks. And not just their staff, but also the the attendees. Yeah, they can't afford their attendees to be. And, and this is all it's all very very practical and and reasonable decision making. Um, but it is one of the effects that is that we're feeling it now, um, not just reading about it in the news. Uh, other events that have been uh, canceled, Google I.O., that's a big one. Mm -hmm. That's it was going to be um, 
when was the the date for that? Uh, nope, that's not the link. The proper link. In the next uh, two months or so, uh, Google I/O, Facebook uh, F8 conference is canceled. Um, what else? Uh, and those are the those are the big like technology events. The Geneva um, Motor Show. Did you see this video? This was no, super I, fascinating. I thought it was an empty motor show. It was. That's right. Um, the city of Geneva, uh, due to the concerns, said that any gathering of larger than a thousand people had to be canceled. And so this was right before the motor show was going to start. Oh, that was mandated. Yes. Really. So the wow. convention center could not operate. Wow. Uh, but the exhibitors had already shipped out their freight mm -hmm. and had their booth, you know, not properly set up, but had them in the building. And so there's a video of you find, uh, if you look at it, um, if you search GF Williams on, on YouTube uh, of this photographer walking through kind of what looks like a wasteland of a, uh, of a giant, auto show convention. The cars yeah. are there. Mm -hmm. um, there's there's lots of booths set up and it looks like, you know, it was all the people who were setting up just left for the day mm -hmm. and are, aren't coming back. Yeah. I don't know if, if everyone in the in the world who listens to this podcast has the same concerns as as we might in the Bay Area. It's it's a we have a different type of perspective here, having had the first, you know, community contracted case of coronavirus like less than a week ago just down the road. And uh, then in in Seattle, of course, on our coast, they have had the first US deaths from coronavirus. So I think there are certain nucleuses of of concern for the what's what, you know, a pandemic that could potentially open up and become more of a, more of an issue in the country. Um, but yeah, I know that there are people who are saying there's much to do about nothing. So we will, we will just have to wait and see. And we're going to get kind of an update, hopefully uh, when we dial Kishore in later on in the podcast. Yeah. Uh, other events, uh, well, around the world, so Disneyland and uh, Legoland Universal Studios in Japan have, have closed. Uh, close their doors for the time being. Yep. I think that makes total sense. Again, these are disruptions that while they may be over cautious, it is totally the right thing to do because you don't want these big facilities and uh, these parks to be uh, potentially epicenters of outbreaks. Uh, and then, um, you know, there are conventions that are still going on. For example, the Olympics so far yeah. are still on, although there's talk that they may be postponed as well. That's a massive... How do you postpone the Olympics? I, I know, right? As an organizational thing. Yeah. Thankfully, it's the Summer Olympics, right? Yeah. I mean, and a lot of these events, you could imagine, they could do virtual events online. They could yeah. do what Nintendo yeah. does for E3. But, but eSports, nothing but eSports yeah, exactly. for the Olympics. I'm having a hard time imagining what the Olympics does. Uh, and um, uh, there are a lot of comic book conventions. I mean, Adam was just at one uh, this past weekend, C2E2, uh, but there are things like Emerald City Comic Con, which is happening, and uh, some exhibitors are not showing up there, but the actual convention itself is still happening. So, And we know a lot of people in the Seattle area uh, who are going to Emerald City Comic Con, and we'd love to hear from you uh, about what that convention is going to be like um, when you're there, uh, if you're still going, um, in in the wake of all all these all these happenings, there is a website you can go to. It's isitcanceledyet.com. Yeah, uh, there's the, the the top half of the website's useful. The bottom half is is for funsies. It's it, there's little funsies in, in, interjected throughout, peppered yeah. throughout. I like the funsies. You don't care you, for the funsies? I don't not not so much for the no. funsies. Yeah, uh, <laughs> E3 is another convention we're keeping an eye on. So far, not canceled. Yeah. You know, odds are probably will be. That's interesting. I, I talked to some game industry friends and they said, maybe not. Maybe not. You know, look at PAX. Like PAX is thriving. It's doing great. Um, I, that's, I saw the, t the tweets from people at PAX and it looks like just as packed yeah. as everyone. I guess at, at PAX, everyone's used to just doing the elbow high five. <laughs> right? the, the thing is, that is a, that is a is. community fan event, yeah. which is a lot of people are asking E3 to become that. But this might be the year to do it. Oh, you know, just like oh, that, the that, ESA, make it a no. Hey, so if if it does, if it is a strictly industry event, I think that's the thing holding it back, and it might actually, I could see it being canceled. and see why not. Would you? I mean, if you were planning on going, would you hesitate about going if it was still going on to something E three? Are uh, there events that you would decide not to go to? I'm considering not going to pinball league. Like, <gasps> absolutely. Like, yeah. just like your, yeah, every weekly. I mean, if Local we're being honest, league? The, the weak link in the chain is the kids because they, they go to school. <laughs> well, that's, that's, I mean, that's, <laughs> right. you don't need to explain that. Right. I've known that for, for at least 15 months. Well, yeah, but when, when 
your son starts going to school, mm. that's a whole no, new, uh, you know, uh, hole in, in the wall. Right, they go to the Petri dish. Where all of the, the diseases are now just coming in and being shared. But they're the most resilient. The children. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm, I'm not. <laughs> oh, so right. They yeah. bring it home. Okay, it's a Logan's Run thing. And yes. Yeah. Uh, and it's, yeah, so that, that's bad news. So, so it's, I'm wondering, what would it take for a school to get, shut yeah. down for two weeks you know is it going to be hundreds of local cases or is it going to be are we going to get like you know cut our losses and close early who knows mm. who knows i mean I, I could see it happening this year at some point i'm sure there are board members and and, and groups We've, deciding that right now we have emails having, having this conversation our school has said as much yeah 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 and and probably giving parents the option to keep their kids at home if they if they want not yet not yet <laughs> really not openly although i'm are I, your kids asking for it I mean, kids get sick all the time and stay home. So I'm sure they would treat it like that. Right. But is there an awareness, I guess, uh, in the elementary and middle school yeah. community and, and the kids themselves of coronavirus and what it may mean? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I think that they, the, the kids are probably, their opinions are reflective of their parents' opinions and whatever they're talking about at home. And like I said, you know, some people think it's much ado about nothing. A lot of the kids say that. And a lot of the kids who have parents who are more concerned are saying, well, this could be real. Hmm. So yeah, it's who knows? All right. Well, we'll keep tabs on things that are canceled, schools and conventions and podcasts. included. And oh, the podcast we can do remotely, Jeremy. Okay. I'm going to make us still do the podcast. <laughs> the people out there, the audio listeners need, need their, even if there's no work commute, they're going to be listening yeah. somehow. Hey, before we're going to move on to our next segment, Whoa. how's your, 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 you were gone last week. What would you do? You get a chance to talk about this. We went to, we went to Tahoe. Oh. Yeah, we're, we um, go every <clears throat> other year or so uh, to ski. That is where one in San Francisco typically goes to, yep. to ski. Yep. And uh, we had a delightful time. I had a birthday. I turned 46. Congratulations. Thanks. And um, yeah, we had a great time. It's very slushy up there. Which uh, resort did you go to? North Star. Ah, that's a good one. <clears throat> we, we, I think we're going to mix it up. If we go back, we're going to go somewhere else. But it's, uh, yeah, we had a great time. The kids just love it. They love it because they don't get to see snow. Ever. I mean, people in the Bay Area, we don't know what's snow. We don't get no, snow. No. Yeah, we don't get seasons, really. Right. Yeah, what is that thing? Uh, a, lot, a lot of people this time of year? None. None. I told you, it was slushy. It was like 60 degrees. Oh, then not a lot of snow or skiing to be had. No. Uh, well, they made snow, you know, yeah, and, yeah, and then yeah. they groom them at night. And mm. you can, it's yeah. okay in the afternoon because it's not like ice, but right, right. It's, it's whatever. That's uh, not as fun. You want powder. Well, yes. Yes, yeah. you do. Yes, yeah. but you, you, take what, you take what you get. Yeah. Yes. You're close to spring break at this point almost. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, happy birthday. Thanks. Happy belated birthday. Mm -hmm. And welcome back. Mm -hmm. I want to start off the segment with a little bit of a down note. I'll we say. had uh, the parting of um, kind of an, an icon in in entertainment news and, and entertainment discussion, uh, James Lipton, who uh, for the longest time hosted Inside the Actor Studio, who was an actor himself, cameos in things like Arrested Development. Um, had done work in soap operas. And yeah, and... Uh, really kind of in our generation, we think of as one of the first who, who did celebrity interviews, actor interviews in a serious way, right. which, in, in a way that a lot of people do now in, in, in great conversations. Uh, he passed away at the age of 93. I used to watch this show every week. Like this was back in my TiVo days, right? Mm -hmm. Like I, I was subscribed to it. We watch all the Inside Actor Studios. I, it was, uh, an hour long, you know, interview program with no scandalous material. It wasn't comedy, yeah. although it had its moments. But I mean, he got actors to open up in a way that I just absolutely got addicted to. And I, I loved that show. And I will, I miss, I miss watching it. But I, you know, he was, man, I, the world is better to have had him in it for sure. Yeah. Well, what are the interview shows that you go to now, if there are any, that fill that void? Um... I mean, I don't, I have no idea. That's a good question. I mean, yeah. there, there's hot ones, which I think is. Which is <laughs> that's, that's for the millennial generation for sure. I mean, I think it's great. I think what they've done is, is a really smart thing, but, yeah. it, but it is not inside the actor's studio. It, no. it, like James Lipton took himself very seriously, but at the same time, like he, he, he got the actors to give in, immensely 
personal interviews and open up about themselves. And like the Robin Williams episode alone was one of the best Robin Williams performances, like on film. Is there an archive of, of this? That's a good question. Know? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure that there is. Yeah. Um, yeah, fantastic show. Yeah, no idea he was 93. Wow. Me neither. Wow. Um, directors and actors themselves now are have lots of platforms to talk about their work. And one of them that I like a lot is Variety's program. Uh, they have a director series uh, where um, directors look at specific scenes of, of movies uh, and they break them down. So they like have a um, almost like a, a screen in front of them and they literally have a dry erase marker that they get to annotate mm -hmm. on the scene they, and they pick um, a, 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 it, would be, it could be a an old movie, it could be a new movie. Like for example, uh, Ryan Coogler for Black Panther did the big fight scene inside the South Korean casino. Uh, there's been a great one, the production designer Forrest Gump talked about the scene where they where Forrest goes to Vietnam and kind of the whole set dressing of that. These are really, really in-depth and fun kind of um, just uh, mini documentaries almost. And it's not yeah. an interview, interview format. It is literally the filmmaker just talking to you and and there's one that was released recently by Ryan Johnson, uh, not for Last Jedi, but for Knives, Knives Out. Out. Have you seen Knives Out yet? Yes, I saw it in the future. Mm. You enjoyed uh, it? I didn't. Oh, sorry. Okay, I think we talked I, about. I this. thought it was all right, uh, but uh, I. It was one one of the rare cases where I saw, like, I figured it out. Like, you know, I saw the ending coming. I, that's not usually me. That's usually you. Mm. So, and I, as I watched it, I actually th thought, I wonder if Norm is enjoying this at all because it seems. I, I let myself roll with it. It seems rather predictable. Did you not fun, like think, okay, this makes perfect sense? I like the way that I rolled with the movie where uh, the moments where I felt like I I was I had an aha moment. Yeah. Oh, it's gonna go this way. He, Ryan Johnson was smart enough to anticipate that, or at least that's what he seeded in, right? Yeah. He gave you the clues to know that, okay, if this clue is planted here, the audience, at least some part of the audience, is going to figure it out very soon after. And so I'm just going to tell them and and not not have to wait till the end. Okay. A big, big reveal. Yeah. Like they, they, he, he, Kept he he kept that pace with his reveals. Okay, um, at least that's all, that's what I felt. I enjoyed the acting immensely. Yeah. I would I would go see the sequel as soon as it's out. And 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 they're working on it. Yeah, it's going to be um, another uh, Daniel Craig playing the detective. Uh, and but the the reason we're talking about this is he broke down the scene in Eyes Out the the uh, the the Chris Evans scene where he pops in and he starts cursing out everyone. And it's a twenty three minute. Um, video where he talks breaks down like the blocking of the scene and Which the framing. Scene is that? It's it's one. It's in the trailer. He's like just like f you f you f you, you know. Yeah. And your shit and your shit. Right. Right. And and it's is I think right a, before the will reading. The reading. Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. And he mentions he drops this this kind of anecdote mm -hmm. in this video where he says that Apple. Refuses or won't this, no, let this you. This is not in the, okay. So this is an interview. This is not about knives out. This is not about knives out. But yeah. he he says this. Yeah. He says that that Apple will not let you use their phones um, for the villain. That's crazy. This is this sounds like a rumor, but he's saying this is fact in Hollywood that Apple will not let will not let movies portray uh, well not allow villains in movies use iPhones so that they won't be associated with evildoers. One, I can't imagine this is actually true. I, there, ha, there are villains in films clearly using iPhones. No. He says they can't? No, I, I think the, absolutely there are villains in films using you. Who, I, I, there got to be. I, I'm trying to like, picture one in my head, be. and maybe I, I can't like, call one out right now, but there mm. has to be. Okay. Uh, maybe what he meant was that Apple will not give you like promotional consideration, right? Like they won't let you show the Apple logo or they won't pay to have their products in your movie hmm. uh, if your villain okay. uses an iPhone. I mean, it's just, it, it is interesting to me how much we think we're in, <laughs> Apple thinks that, that that this makes a difference. Like clearly that there there's some grain of truth to whatever Ryan Johnson is saying. Apple has at some point suggested they they don't want villains using their iPhones, right? Right? I mean, we, we can at least take that for granted, that there's, that's, that conversation was had at some point, yeah. right? So that means that Apple thinks that if villains did use iPhones, 
people would like the iPhone less. <laughs> people would it buy would tarnish it. the reputation. Right. It would, sure. They would sell less iPhones. And and you go back to like Apple TV Plus being its own streaming service, and and there are the rumors when uh, they were spinning up these new shows that the shows had to meet some type of you know, family-friendly guideline because mm-hmm. Apple is a family-friendly brand. And that's not the case at all. These shows are tons of cursing, yeah. swearing. They're, they they tackle very tough subjects. Um, and they're kind of really all, all over the place. Uh, and Apple's okay with that. So I, I, I don't know if right. what he's saying is actually, is actually true. But it did make some headlines. It, yeah, okay. So, okay. So we're going to say it's not true? I don't, I don't think it's true. Okay. Okay. I would like, and, and and from a legal perspective, Apple could not come in and say, you're not allowed to use an iPhone no. in your movie. So that's the question. If it were true, what would the leverage be? Like, what does Apple have that the movie studios need? Because they apparently, like, there's... It's not distribution. It's not like, oh, we're not going to put your movie on iTunes <laughs> right. if, if your villain's using an iPhone. Right. I don't know. It's weird. So I think the leverage is probably if there is an existing relationship... Maybe in that case, like like if there is promotional consideration. The, if, Ars, the Ars Technica article that, that talked about this, they have a quote from somebody, um, an, an, an attorney, who says that you, movie studios do not technically need- They don't need the permission. Approval in Correct. order to use everyday devices on screen. If they are used as the device was intended. Right. Yeah. Okay. Is that is that true? So like yeah. you couldn't like turn a phone into- like something that's not? Is that what you mean? That's the, exactly. Huh. Yeah. Okay. Huh. Yeah. Okay. Or, or make it a big plot point. Communicate with outer space. Could I communicate with aliens with an iPhone as a villain? Like I, would Apple allow, you know, in the inevitable E.T. remake for an iPhone to be used <laughs> oh as the, uh, yeah. the... Have yeah. you seen those commercials? Uh, the VR ones? Uh, well, yeah. E.T. is wearing yes. a VR headset. Yes. Yeah, that's yes, I love it. Okay. it. It's my new. It's my Twitter banner. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> this is for uh, Comcast or Verizon. Yeah. It's it's for one of those big media companies. Oh boy, Elliot's all grown up now. They 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 brought him back. <laughs> Good for him. Good for the actor whose name I don't know. Good right. for him to get get a cash a paycheck. And they rebuilt E.T. Oh yeah. Well, I assume that they rebuilt E.T. Yeah. I mean, yeah. they they had they that had wasn't CG e- though. No, no, it's no, a it real was, deal. It, it was a it was an animatronic. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. All right, we're going off the rails here. Um, other bits of pop culture news. Uh, Amazon Prime as a subscription service is launching a bunch of um, new science fiction shows. They're one of the, the few services where I feel like maybe it's, this is like Jeff Bezos' direction because Jeff Bezos is such a known science fiction fan. Mm-hmm. Like he, was, he cameoed in Star Trek Beyond as an alien. Uh, and, wow. And he's... Definitely, like he is a guy who who loves science fiction, and you know, for his service, maybe it's under his direction, but he wants to see science fiction on there, and that's why they had that Philip K. Dick series, yeah. uh, the a- anthology series, um, and there's a new series coming out called Tales from the Loop. Okay, Tales from the Loop. I'm super excited about this because this is a series based on concept art from an artist, a Swedish artist named Simon uh, Stallenhag. Okay. And I uh, actually featured one of his books on one of my favorite things, I want to say a year or two years ago. But it's you've probably seen this concept art probably floating around. Okay. With these, these wonderfully painted scenes where it's a mix of kind of otherworldly uh, robots with just... Uh, very grounded on earth scenes, you know, farmland, you know, amongst cars, there's an anachronistic aspect to it. There's like cars, farmland, yeah. industry, and then you have like a giant robot um, in, the, in the background. Yeah. Or, and and like, it's an alternate world, right? Of what if these aliens although, or robots Although it gives cohabitate. it a, re- a realism that some sci-fi just lacks. Yes, for sure, right? It's almost um, a Neil Blomkamp style, yeah, right? A District that's what Nine, I was thinking, right? exactly, like, yeah. where, What if these, you know, very fantastical things live very alongside, you know, uh, the earthly population without having to make it a Blade Runner style aesthetic, right? Uh, um, and uh, he released this book called um, Tales from the Loop, and it was a book of concept art with some of his kind of world building behind it that connected some of these pieces together, but uh, it wasn't a graphic novel. It wasn't a story. It wasn't a story okay. really behind it. Uh, and uh, Amazon licensed that art yeah. and now is making this show uh, that's going to be out on April 3rd. And there was a trailer. And it's produced by um, uh, some... Uh, 
Swedish um, filmmakers like Never Let Me Go, the director of Never Let Me Go. Uh, Matt Reeves, who um, is doing the Batman, yep. is also a, a producer on it. Uh, and um, it's about a town who lives it's, it's going to be a not really an anthology series but each episode i think is going to tell us a different story about people who live in this town that are all connected by these by these robots and these creatures these i was going to ask because you said there was no story to the book and they licensed the book and so if every yeah. image is kind of disconnected are the episodes going to be similar i think i think that's the idea they're taking like a piece of art and then using that as inspiration for an episode yeah but then creating their own mythology for how these things can be connected but it was the, in, in the trailer you see essentially these 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 concept art pieces you know realized and put on screen and it's just it's, it's really lovely that's awesome yeah uh, he has a, another book um that I, I also like uh the uh electric coast i want to say um i'm just gonna google that quickly electric state the electric state it's about um uh tr- uh, traveling uh, a road trip journey across uh, the West Coast, and uh, that's also licensed as well um, to do uh, options as well to turn to a movie. And I believe the Russo brothers are turning that into a movie. It does producing that. It looks awesome. I mean, the the aesthetic of it, they have a lot of children in there that are yeah. using technology in a way that they're very comfortable with, which makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, it do, it looks like it might be you know there might be some scary moments but it doesn't doesn't look like a horror show so yeah and, and I, I think this is totally in the vein of like Black Mirror in terms of like technology interfacing yeah. with everyday life but le- I hope less so much of like an a cautionary tale and more in the vein of like um, a, like a, a science fiction novella of like they're just trying to tell a story you might expect that from Amazon yeah yeah. Um, Indiana Jones 5 is being filmed. Well, we'll be starting filming in a couple months. Does that uh, mean we have to acknowledge 4? It does, doesn't it? Yes. Mm-hmm. You know, I rewatched 4 a couple months back, and I enjoy it for what it is. Get out. Steven, I'll, I'll do Steve, the rest of this show myself. It's, it's still Steven Spielberg. The yeah. worst Spielberg movie <laughs> is still, I mean, they're, it's still, um, he's such, he, you can't not enjoy watching a Spielberg movie just for his visual composition, just for like the inventiveness he has in this filmmaking. There's, there's was good stuff in that movie. I'm not saying it's a good movie. Mm-hmm. I'm saying there's good stuff Look, in that movie. If you're going to make an Indiana Jones film, it has to meet a minimum bar. It just has to be a you know, minimum, just what's, a what's minimum of quality. That mi- and that, unfortunately for you, if you're making a an Indiana Jones film, that minimum bar is quite high. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's actually pretty good. I'm mean, higher or lower than a Star Wars movie. <laughs> Well, they're both Lucasfilm products. That's a good point. Like, that's a very good, that's an interesting thing. But because of the nostalgia and because of the love you have for the, the first film, the first three the first films. Three. Okay, all yeah, three. All okay. three are okay. fantastic. Okay. I mean, the, the, you think all three set a bar? Yes. Yeah, there's an expectation involved here. And it was, oh, man, that, that's, that's absolutely true. But you, you expect with Spielberg, like, he, like Lucas it like, could have been hands off enough to, to let it be good. But uh, maybe, maybe you're right. Maybe it was Lucas's contaminating of that fourth movie. Is he involved in the fifth? He, he's not, right? No, At Lucas all. is done. He's out. Yeah, and Spielberg might be done too. Yeah. Because the report is now that Spielberg himself isn't directing it. Right. That James Mangold, who directed Ford v. Ferrari, uh, will take the helm. It will be Harrison Ford back. He'll still be Indiana Jones, um, you know, in his mid-70s. He's a mentor of some kind. He's, maybe he's going to take on the Sean Connery role. He's gonna be tweed jacketed, right? You know, he's gonna be Professor Jones, and and may I, I, he's not gonna be swinging on ropes. Junior, uh. yeah, right. I, yeah. I don't think, and, and it's not been confirmed. But I don't think Shia LaBeouf is back in this one. That okay. was the big, that was that was the problem we all had, right? Let's be honest. That was the problem we had with Indiana Jones Four. It, well, I mean, whatever. I, I mean, it, I'm not gonna blame it on Shia LaBeouf. I, th- I think they made some very crucial directing decisions, um, story decisions, plot decisions, or f- all I remember is swinging on the vines. That, and th- that's and that was the that everyone talks about swinging on the vines. That is the, by far the worst part of the movie. I don't remember that because people talk about it. I remember that because I saw it. I didn't. I didn't see it with any expectation. I was. I was hoping to be Indiana Jones. Good. Good movie. But that, I'm saying that everyone talks about it because that is what we all remember. Because that was the worst part of the movie. It was bad CG. It was unbelievable yeah. action. Yeah. It was if you if you look at like the action sequences that Spielberg has put together, kind of like the the chase stuff. One of the best things he's done is in uh, Tintin. 
Do you remember that chase sequence in Adventures of Tintin? I did Where they're going uh, through the town. Tintin had that Polar Express Uncanny uh, Valley, so I never watched it. Oh, you should watch it. But it has that Uncanny Valley, doesn't it? Yeah, but they're cartoon. They're 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 not supposed to be photo real characters. They're still yeah. kind of with the. I should see the, it. The, yeah, you should see it right. with the art style of Hergay. Um, I I don't think that all of Indiana Jones Four is bad. <laughs> Okay. I think there are some really fun right. sequences Whatever. in there. Let's move on. What, tell me about Indiana Jones 5. It's well, we don't know anything about 5, but my, my point is, without Spielberg, why make Indiana Jones 5 at all? I can understand. I think maybe Spiel- making Indiana Jones movies is a young man's game. I think that's a, it's fine for them to pass the mantle. They, they did it with Star Wars, and it got better. Well, at that point, then why even make... I mean, Indiana Jones is so tight. Unlike Star Wars, yeah. which was not just tied to Luke Skywalker or Han Solo or Carrie Fisher uh, or Princess Leia. Uh, Indiana Jones is tied to the, the namesake, right? The, right. The, the, the one actor, the one character. Unless you're going to go a full reboot, go prequel or complete reimagining and recast it, if you're going to do Harrison Ford, Indiana Jones, you also got to do Spielberg because then you want to close the story. You want to say, okay, maybe we didn't get do what we wanted to do in four. We want to end Indy on a good note. This is your one chance. Before you're so, you're so gentle, you're retires. so gentle. You're like James Lipton. Like he would never criticize anybody's work on the on his show. And you a are of, you I, are so kind to Indy. I'm, 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 I'm not saying it's a good movie. I think, I'm just saying I understand that mm-hmm. a lot. There's a lot of people who did a lot of hard work on that film, and you know, creative decisions. That's where James made. Lipton's coming from. I think he he has that. That that inner you know view on the industry, and he appreciates all the effort that went into it. And, and you I, do. And I will say one. even you know, and I, I'm not afraid to be critical of a performance like Harrison Ford in Indiana Jones Four. I think gave a better performance than he did in Force Awakens or Blade Runner. Wow! All right, there you go. At least in Bla- it, at least it felt like he even he cared somewhat. Really, I remember thinking he knew this was nonsense and. But that's Indiana Jones. That's the character too. Whatever he lives in a, a crazy. The only surprise in a pulp I, novel. My only pulp comic surprise is that, that in Spielberg not doing it is that I mean clearly he could do it if he wants. He's Steven Spielberg. He can decide what to direct and what not to direct. He, the fact that he doesn't want to do it tells me something. Like I don't know because he must know. He must know that's his worst movie. Him. No. <laughs> I'm going to rank Spielberg movies. Yeah. What do you think is his worst movie? I think probably that one. No. Uh, Lost, uh, Jurassic Park 2, Lost World. I doubt it. I don't remember hating that movie. Well, I was a kid, so I did, I did enjoy that movie. But I, <laughs> I, I, when I, if I rewatch those movies, I. Um, so I'm just surprised that he doesn't want another shot. You know, yeah. it's like Michael Jackson coming back to, to play basketball again. Like, he, he, like, I'm surprised Spielberg doesn't want to at least just cleanse himself of Indiana Jones by doing it again. But, or, so what this tells me is that maybe he's, he's beyond that. He's like above it and he's wise enough to pass it on. Well, if he is still involved at least, you yeah. know, on the producing side yeah. and, and at, at this point, maybe he had done enough work on the film already to lay the groundwork and it's just the day to day you know, he's already blocked out all the, the kind of uh, types of scenes and the visual flair that he wanted. And then James Mangold is literally there just, just to direct the performances. Then I, c- I could see that. Uh, in terms of Spielberg's worst films. <laughs> Did you Google it? I mean, I'm just looking at his <laughs> list of films. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're all pretty good. <laughs> they're yeah. all pretty good. If you're talking about the films he directed, like <laughs> yeah, of course, he, of course, he's produced some some. No, bad yeah, movies. yeah, producing means nothing, right? Yeah. Putting your name behind producing, there's the, the, that can range from you know you read the script and made some notes to you were heavily involved day to day. Like right. that, absolutely as as a title doesn't mean much to me. Uh, Crystal Skull, I think, is definitely up there in terms of the worst. Yeah. <clears throat> mm-hmm. I never saw the BFG. He didn't do the Jaws sequels, right? No, 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 he didn't. Yeah, yeah I, 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 I kind of like all his films. Yeah. Munich. Oh, yeah. Even The Terminal. What's wrong with The Terminal? It's great. I mean, it's kind of it's just unspectacular. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a solid right. film. 
you know, Hook people don't like, but I love Hook. Well, up. that that was like high school for me, and so I, I dug Hook. I had the soundtrack was, yeah. and everything. Oh, yeah. In elementary school. <laughs> you had, I didn't have the sound, quite of the soundtrack, but, you know, for me, it was being yeah. the Lost Kids. Uh, War of the Worlds, some people might say, is, is his worst one. Tom Cruise War of the Worlds movie. What do you think? That's that. See, I get that in Independence Day mixed up. Independence Day is not him. That's Roland Emmerich. Yeah, no, I know it's not him. But just in thinking of the of the movie, I forget. That one people say was a disappointment because it was so little focused on the uh, the war with the yeah the Martians. It was just you know, and it was a small story. It was it was a Spielberg story, right? It was a father and uh, his kids trying to uh, survive in this apocalypse. I think the takeaway here is that. A bad Spielberg film is a rare thing, and it must be something strange. There must be something else contaminating the water. He's made unremarkable films. I would say like Bridge of Spies. I, I, it was I, up for Oscars. Yeah, but I, I found it kind of unremarkable. It was okay. It was fine. <laughs> yeah, but it, it didn't like. It didn't need Spielberg. <laughs> right? I don't know about that. That that's that's your taste speaking there. I think that it's still a high quality film. That like you can't mention Bridge of Spies and Crystal Skull and like say that. Like they just don't even seem like the same director. They they seem completely at odds with each other. If I had the option of watching Bridge of Spies or Crystal Skull uh, as just like yeah. a Sunday afternoon, you're a nerd though. I would watch Crystal Skull <laughs> because that's at least a fun romp, right? Bridge right. of Spies too, too too serious. Okay, good performances, but doesn't scream Spielberg to me. Anyway, hopefully we can get Steven on the podcast. I know. Talk about it. All hey, this. Lipton's not here anymore. You know, maybe right. this podcast can mm -hmm. can take up the mantle inside the director's studio. Uh, one uh, trailer we want to talk about before we leave pop culture segment. This is a, a new animated film from Sony Pictures Animation. It's called Connected. And uh, even though I literally just two minutes ago said that producers, uh, I, I take producing involvement with a grain of salt. Uh, this one is being produced by Phil Lord and Chris Miller. The oh, wow. Lego guys. The are directors right? of Lego Movie 1 and 2, 21 Jump Street, 22 Jump Street. Uh, the first directors of Solo. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and also uh, the co-writers um, on um, and producers on the uh, Into the Spider Verse film. So they have produced this film. They are not writing it or directing it. Ah, who's directing it? Uh, who knows? Uh, one of the guys who did Gravity Falls, the cartoon. Oh, funny. Okay. Yeah. So it has that sense of humor. Yeah. Uh, we're playing the trailer behind us. You should definitely uh, look it up on YouTube. Um, but it's. I like this style of animation. It's different. This is Sony going with a very different style of animation. Again. You so, mean like compared to Spider-Man? It's way different from Spider-Man. Well, so, so when you think of like, I'm not saying all animation studios have ones, have like their look, yeah. but Illumination definitely has a look. Okay. You know, the people who do, those are the people who do the uh, Minions films and the Secret Life of Pets films, mm -hmm. right? I think their style, their, their art direction yeah. and the way they do animals mm -hmm. or expressions have a look. DreamWorks, I think also somewhat has a look when you look at things like the crudes and how it's to train your well track. known that they have a look. They have, they have a facial expression yes, that is yeah. very you, you know, common yeah. in DreamWorks films. Yeah, and Pixar to some extent No, has, no look, no look. <laughs> It's quality. I'm not saying it's not quality, <laughs> but if you look at how they do the humans in Inside Out and how they do the humans in... Soul? Soul, they, they are similar. Are they? I think they're a little bit similar. And, and that's, not, that's absolutely true. Like if you look at Incredibles, obviously very different visual style. Right, that was the first film where they really even did a lot of humans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this... Yeah, and, and, and even like Disney, going to Disney Animation Studios, right? Like if you look at Moana, Tangled, Frozen, those characters have a Disney look yes. to them, right? Right, and that's a that's inherited from the Disney right style I animation, think, yeah, for but, sure, right? Even though the the the, the rendering and the effects may be different, that's very intentional, sure. Sony, it seems like very different, and then Paramount also. Like if you look at the, the uh, Transylvania film, or um, oh, what's one of the ones they do? Uh, but anyway, Sony, the Norman thing. There was a yeah. There was a, a, a okay. polar bear right. one called yeah yeah. Um, I, I, Ice Age, right? That, that's Fox. Paranorman is the one I was thinking. Oh, of. Uh, that's Leica. Oh, was it? Yeah, that was Leica. stop motion. That was stop motion. Oh, wow. Did you not know Paranormal? Stuff? I didn't. It was see a the combination. Movie. I didn't see the. Oh, movie. you should watch it. It's okay. really good. All right. Appreciate stop motion stuff. 
Uh, Leica, also, there's a look. Yeah. Right, if you look at the um, um, Kubo and Paranorman, yeah. Coraline. Sony, super interesting. This has a similar kind of look to uh, the cloudy of the Chance of Meatballs. Okay. But they're doing, I think, similar what they did with Into the Spider-Verse and using CG animation, to, but makes it look like a different medium. In the Into the Spider-Verse was CG, but it looks like comic art. Right. So they're doing a lot here with like hard edges and um, the eyes almost look solid white. So I think they're doing a lot of things that would traditionally be used in 2D illustration, but they're bringing it into... There's th almost a painterly style Third dimension. It. Yeah. Yeah. If you look at like the, the, even the backgrounds, like the wood paneling, there's mm -hmm. a whole, it looks like watercolors. Right. I'm really, really into the style. Like the lines are all squiggly a little bit mm -hmm. uh, on their shirts and on... And, I'm really into the the, the uh, visual styling. Yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't noticed that. You're, look at those trees in the background. Those are paintings. Like, yeah. There's, that yeah. is not but a it's CG model. Right? It's not like yeah. they did a matte painting, with, uh, C, but it's all in CG. And I, I really appreciate that these artists are allowed to kind of uh, experiment with the visual style, even though they're still using computer rendered yeah. you know, environments and characters. So, but the story, the story like, itself, the, the trailer yeah. itself almost plays like a short film. Like it tells you a lot about what's going on. Uh, it's a two minute, 40 second trailer. And it's a f dad who is, um, you know, <clears throat> probably very familiar to a lot of people in the podcast audience, especially in the, you know, in the West coast <laughs> where we uh, don't allow technology at the table. And, um, we're trying to communicate. You can relate. You trying have to, kids. Yeah, who, trying to communicate with, with kids and get them to do interpersonal things instead yeah. of watching TikTok. Yeah, yeah. And so, like, that is the dynamic. They have a fa family of mother and father with two kids. And uh, it, I guess that there's some... Daughter going to college, yeah. wants to leave the family, leave the nest. The father wants to feel connected to his family. That's the name of the film. Yep. While the kids are connected to the internet, and he to goes, their devices. He goes too far, ends up accidentally breaking one of her devices. Yep. And yep. then uh, they go on a road. It's a road trip. How do I solve this? I got to yes. connect. She's going to go to college. Yes. Road trip to college. Yes. On its face, I do think it did, does sound a little derivative. It's like, oh, this is an obvious story, uh, a parable about our times and the uh, addictions that we have to our devices. I think unlike most cartoons, I think p families might go to see it because they can obviously relate to it like on on that level though. But the trailer does tease these fantastical elements that I, that I think are going to excite me or people who may not relate to this yet, right? And they have there are robots in this. Mm -hmm. There's there's some type of yeah, it ends up he, he's right. It ends up like he's clearly justified in yeah. thinking that technology is is bad because technology turns bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, and I hope that the guidance of uh, Chris Miller and Phil Lord with their humor, their irreverence, and also just the kind of big bold storytelling that they do. Yeah, because I love Claudio with the Chance of Meatballs. Um, I hope that makes it through in what, this film. What I hope to see from this film is not just that he's right, but that the kids are also... The kids like, are right too. They're also their form of right. Yes. Like so that they can sort of... Because uh, I'd love to understand what it's like to grow up with a <laughs> cell phone. Like I don't know what that's like. And so I would like a new perspective on, on how that is actually not all bad. Just like you would hope the kids would love to know what it's like to have them grown up with dial-up or no internet. <laughs> if only you could make, if we can make a, a whole generation of people appreciate, you know, we're the last generation, Jeremy. I was, I was telling my son about that. I was like, you see, he was downloading, you know, I don't know, Far Cry or something on Steam. And I had pointed out how fast he was downloading it. You know, it was like. With gigabit. Yeah. Like. Just Thanks, Sonic. Megabytes a second. Yeah. And I said, do you know how big a megabyte is? It's like, it's, it's a million. Oh, it's inconsequential to him. Yeah, it's a million bytes. You're right, a yeah. million bytes. Yes. And then I was like, do you know, I, when I downloaded games, I had to download games at 300 megabits. Oh, you, you were lucky, Jeremy. Do you remember <laughs> when the Quake 3, Q3 test came out? Q3 test, id Software yeah. released its own download manager for Q3 test. Yeah. And back then, that was multiplayer only. This was back in 2000, I want to say. And this was the first demo. Anyone who was in the PC gaming was looking forward to this. You get two maps to play in Quake 3 to check out. And, and this is when the graphics cards were, were, or discrete graphics were first blowing up. Yeah. When people were buying Voodoo 1s, Voodoo 2s for this and uh, NVIDIA Reva 128s. And 
downloading, do you remember how big the Q3 test was? Um, I'm guessing it was maybe a meg. No, no, it was more than that. It was like 20 megs. Was it? Yeah. Holy, what? Yeah. That, okay, you say so. I'm going to confirm. Q3 test was 22 megs. Look at that. Boom. That, 22, yeah. two, 22 megs. You know why I know this? Because it took me two weeks to download it. Two Be, weeks? Because it started and stopped. Okay. But I actually... On, met- on 28K. Dial up. As long as we're just one upping each other here, what I, I actually misspoke. I I meant I, what I was telling my son was that I downloaded things at 300 bits a second. Yeah, okay. I, I was okay. on 300 baud, not 300 KB. No, yeah, I was on 300 <laughs> baud. So I it was like download a 64K game it took me 45 minutes. I mean it was nuts, and I would I of course sound download things overnight too. Two weeks though, two. Well, it would start. I would leave it on during day, go to school. Yeah, come back and it would fail. And oh, so I got to no. restart it. And Wait. so it was two weeks of trial and error oh, to get it. To did you have your, like a dedicated phone line? No, no. So your, your parents were like picking up the phone and yes, <laughs> yes. What? You, yes. <laughs> People don't know that to say that you had to wow. share. Imagine the cell phone equivalent to that, right? That you could not text, which was, is equivalent of making phone calls. You, if someone texted you while you were trying to watch a YouTube video, that would ruin your ability to watch a YouTube video. That's the equivalent. That's, that's yeah. the equivalent of not being able to download and make a phone call. Mm-hmm. Right. So no Snapchat, you could choose Snapchat or YouTube or Twitch. You can't have both. That's what it was like to have dial up. And, and even after I downloaded the Q3 test and ran those benchmarks. What was that? Like 95, 96? Uh, no, no, no. It was 99. Q3. Oh, the Q3 test. Q3 test. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that was the one I was excited for. Well, you had a job by then. Weren't you at Pandora and no, PC was, Gamer that by that like point? Four years. I was at PC Gamer like a year Like after. a year later? A year later. Okay. Yeah. Talked about it on my, on my uh, interview. <laughs> Q3 <laughs> test. But we're the last generation. We're the last generation who remembers, mm-hmm. who lived, you know, a significant part of our life yeah. without internet. Mm-hmm. And then are living, of course, the rest of our lives with internet. And I love it. I would not want to be- You want the perspective. I wouldn't want to be in any other generation, honest to God, like even in the far future, because to be the generation that grew up- That bridge the gap. That saw video games begin and go, like when Asteroids was like something amazing. Yeah. Missile Command, like Defender, like when these things were brand new. Is this is this the equivalent of someone growing up in the 1800s, 1700s and saw the printing press and like we had to write down books manually and then- you could buy a book. I suppose so. I suppose there's a, there's a similarity there, but I think I, I'm not sure if books have ever been as popular as video games are in terms of like consuming generation or two now. Yeah, it, definitely not cars. Like there were people you know a hundred years ago who lived in the world with horses yeah. and then automobiles, right? And that changed the world for sure. Uh, or industrial revolution, right? Which is not to say that books aren't better than video games, even. But I just don't know if, like, if they've ever. If they, do you think? Do you think books were the video games before video games? Yeah, form of entertainment mm-hmm. and creative output. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yeah, they still are. But ha- like, have they been usurped? I mean, every kid plays video. I mean, games. The age of mechanical reproduction, right? The illuminated manuscripts versus the printed, printed image. Yeah, and printed page. Right. I mean, mass production. Dem- democratizing of publishing, right? There, there are analogs there, but d- definitely not as pervasive as digital technologies. Video yeah. games just being one part of it. And right. then internet connectivity, digital devices. It's all about convenience. It's all about feeding, getting those neurons firing and, you know, just feeding that itch. Well, and also connection and how easily it is to connect to millions of people yeah. as we are doing right now. And, and how the world before that, how isolated, but still how s- the strength of those connections maybe were, were stronger. The strength of one's relationship with the characters in a book, you mean? Or, or, or no, you, 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 the, the, the five friends you had over a message board. Oh, the sure. The strength of those connections right. over the kind of more ephemeral connections that we have today. Yeah. Being, everyone being interconnected. Perhaps so. Yeah. Maybe that's why the VR community is so tight. That, that could be it too. Tight. Yeah. I wonder, what, what will that be for my child? Yes. No idea. It's scary. Connected.
in theaters. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that does it for our pop culture segment. Um, and before we move on to technology news, I'll let you know that this week's episode of This Is Only a Test is made possible with support from TurboTax. People do amazing things every day, so it makes no sense that they shouldn't feel confident about doing their taxes. TurboTax believes that with the right tools and encouragement, people can do anything, yes, even taxes. And with TurboTax Live, you have even access to to CPAs and EAs on demand who are available to answer your questions or to give advice on how to file, even on nights and weekends. So you can do your taxes with ease and confidence and never feel stuck or alone during the tax process. You can also rest assured that you'll get the best possible outcome, which means you can file your taxes quickly and easily and get back to all those amazing things people do every day. TurboTax, all people are tax people. Sorry, I was I was communicating with Kishore, so letting, ah, him, letting him know we're just yeah. starting. Yes, tech news. Yeah, get get, get him ready to. Yes, to get his voice to, voice oh, yes. You know what yes. he does before the podcast. Oh yeah, sure. la, 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 la. <laughs> yeah. takes a a, a, a ginger, right. uh, sucks on a, a, a ginger candy, a little, little gargle. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Oh, he's got oh, ooh. I just got an email that the new Mickey and Minnie ride is uh, opening at uh, Hollywood Studios. There's so, another new ride. There's a new ride. It's replacing the um, American movie classics, the old animatronic ride going through them. Hmm. Oh, I, I sigh because I love that old ride, the one at Hollywood Studios. I don't know if you- I've you never even been, been to Hollywood yeah, Studios. Yeah. yeah, Hollywood Studios was a half day park before they opened Galaxy's Edge. And one of the premier rides was this um, kind of, uh, it was a dark ride that went through the history of film and they had animatronics replicating some iconic scenes in film from Wizard of Oz, Singing in the Rain, Aliens, yeah. and this great showcase of, of the animatronics and they closed and it, it was inside um, the um, their version of the Man Chinese Theater, okay. right, in Hollywood, uh, their version in Hollywood Studios. That got shut down and being replaced with the first Mickey Mouse ride, Mickey and Minnie's um, Hollywood Studios uh, Runaway Railway, which is kind of a, a, a kid-friendly, sounds fun. A little bit of a roller, not roller coaster, but you know, you're on a train, a train ride. Yeah, not Thunder Mountain, though. No, yeah. no, 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 no. All right, yeah, well, I've, I missed it by two weeks, and also I'm bummed that the other ride is has gone. That's what I wanted to say. I okay. emailed that that ride was. All right, uh, some video game news to kick things off here. Half Life video game news, kinda, kinda. What? Maybe. Oh, right, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Death Stranding, which um, Kojima and his studios uh, uh, developed and released on PS, PlayStation, uh, PS4. Highly regarded game of 2019. Yeah, uh, met, still haven't played it. Got many awards at the Games Awards. You know, the um, hiking simulator, backpacking now, simulator. Yeah, but I think that that's not selling it correctly. I think that the... the Apparently, I haven't played it either, but the very first part of the game is a lot of that, but it opens up into something entirely different. Well, I'm looking people, forward to what that entirely different may people be. People who play it really like it. Well, it's very, it's a Kojima game, right? So mm -hmm. big ideas, um, interesting art style. Mm -hmm. Guillermo del Toro's in this game, as well as Norman Reedus. He went to my high school. Guillermo del Toro? Yep. No. Norman Reedus. <laughs> Like it went, what? <laughs> Benicio oh. del Toro went to my high school. Oh, different, different del Toro. Different del Toro. Yeah. Different, different del Toro. How dare you? Uh, it's being ported to PC, and it will be released yep. on June second on Steam and the Epic Game Store. Awesome. Now on Steam, there'll be some bonuses, including Half Life mm -hmm. tie-in. What does that mean? But I don't know. It makes it look a little silly. I didn't. I thought the game was took itself more seriously than this. Maybe not. I think there are uh, accessories you can dress your character in okay. to make him look more like Gordon Freeman. Glasses, head crab hat. There's you can wear the gravity gloves from Half Life Alex. So definitely they've got assets and are have partnered with Valve to put these uh, Half Life universe assets into Death Stranding. Yeah, and it's launching simultaneously with Epic. Right? Yes, so they yes, didn't, Epic didn't second. get the exclusive on this one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I'm definitely gonna look forward to playing this, or at least. The first couple hours, the hiking simulator. 
If it's relaxing, if it's like a thing I can just zone out and, and, and do. Yeah. Then is that what you want from life? That's what I want from video games these okay. days. Yeah. Cool. Uh, the photo mode as well for people who want to take these really cool photos. Yeah. And there goes Norman Reedus uh, with a head crab on him. Uh, and that's June 2nd. Um, some Apple rumors. Apple, of course, or always looking to the next thing. Uh, not talking iPhone this week, but we're talking uh, displays on lapbook, laptops, laptops, MacBooks, and also the iMac. Uh, the latest rumor out of analysts uh, and from the supply chain is that Apple is going to start looking to mini LED screens releasing later this year uh, on the iPad Pro and maybe even uh, the um, the MacBook Pros, the 16-inch and uh, whatever the 13-inch might become. What does that mean to me, the consumer, Norm? So uh, there's going to be some confusion because micro uh, mini LEDs are different from micro LEDs. You followed CES this past year, micro LEDs were a uh, hot new technology and uh, kind of the the successor to OLED. A lot of display manufacturers are investing a lot of money uh, doing research and building up factories for micro LED production. They okay. have all the benefits of OLED without the burn-in. Outstanding. Uh, but mini LEDs are basically our traditional LEDs, except that the backlights, you know, how you have a backlight to light up the, the panels, but you don't with OLED, and I assume you don't with micro LED. Correct, correct. But we're not there. The OLEDs are very expensive, yeah. and OLEDs have burning issues over a long time. Um, and micro LEDs are very expensive because they're not even out yet, and <laughs> the fabs are still being made okay. right now. Yeah. So the cheaper, more cost effective, and still standard is LCDs. Yep. And the LCDs are backlit with LED lights. Ah, yes, and, yes, yes. And the LED lights on, whether it's your TV or your laptop, have uh, basically zones. The, 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 it used to be one big light, mm -hmm. and with the development of uh, LED lights, uh, they could have smaller lights yeah. to backlight, mm -hmm. and then you have to find a good balance to diffuse that, that backlight and to not have, uh, to have even lighting okay. throughout, right? Yep. So you don't have these kind of weird dark spots around the edges, uh, as well as local dimming, which allows for better battery usage uh, and also a better contrast. So are you telling me that, that m mini, mini, LED mini LEDs are the backlight yes. for LCD displays? And it is, if mini LEDs is just the all, uh, all catch all name for LCD displays with now smaller <laughs> backlights. Okay. Small to a point where they can be two millimeter in Whoa, size. Whoa, wow, that is mini. So they're talking about maybe a, a doubling of, uh, or, or quadrupling of of ba um, zones of backlights. Yeah. Because um, that on, used on to equivalent be, size. to get zones at all, used to sort of pay a premium, right? Yes. It used to be like a global backlight and then the zones yep. are premium. But now you're saying it's like super zoned. Yes, and super zoned, and that would be the standard okay. uh, for at least Apple products on things like the iPad and the MacBook Pro. Interesting. Which just means perhaps you get better, you know, better contrast. Right, and, better black levels. Uh, yep, yep. And maybe brighter, brighter screens as well. Uh, the bigger and, news and no to burn. come out of this, and no burn, of course. And there, I mean, you're not getting burn in on these screens because <coughs> only and, the iPhone uses OLED. And it's cheaper, I would imagine, because LCDs are basically free now. Like, I don't know if you've they're noticed. So, they're like, uh, yeah, there's yeah. you. If you go to Best Buy, you can get 55, 65 inch TVs for like nothing compared yeah. to what I they mean, used to cost. I mean, the the factories are, yeah. they have a lot of exp expertise and experience. They can cut them at any size, and it really, yeah, you know, it, it's it's a commodity product. Right. The, the, the LCD panel itself. So these OEMs and Apple need to find ways to make them interesting and improve the quality on those LCDs. Right. All right. Good. And that's let's say they're bad products. LCDs are great. We, I mean, I have. All my devices, you know, aside from the iPhone, use LCDs. And Your I'm TV is not. My TV is not. It's true. But, you know, um, my laptop, desktop, all LCDs. LCDs fine. LCDs totally fine. Uh, but the bigger uh, rumor is that in addition to uh, the 16-inch MacBook Pro getting this display, uh, the 13-inch MacBook Pro, which is what you're using right now, yep. may get a similar upgrade to what the 16-inch got which is that its screen might get bigger while the form factor stays the same. And the Apple may be looking to bump up and revamp the 13-inch MacBook Pro and make it a 14.1-inch MacBook Pro. That seems like their MO is to make bigger screens keep the same form factor. Yeah, make it maybe slightly thicker 
for, for battery purposes. Do you have a lot of bezel on your screen? Not, I mean, I'm going to say it's not terrible, but it, there's certainly room oh, for there's improvement. there's definitely room for improvement. Yeah. I see a lot of that's, space up there. That's right, Tim Cook. Yeah, that was, oh my God, look <laughs> at that. And there's at least another inch, 1.1 in, inch of improvement I could see on that display there. I'm, I'm sure that's just how the conversation went. Yes. <laughs> uh, look at that. Mm, the engineer. Look at, look at that. They get the tape measure out there. Right. Uh, yep. Yeah, I, I, want, I want this part gone. You can keep that part. Yep. And, and keep that part for a front-facing camera. Okay. There you go. For your for your FaceTime camera, uh, for that would be that would be pretty good. Um, a lot of people love that thirteen. That's the the, the super popular form factor um, for the MacBook Pro line. Good for airplanes. Um, the question is whether this will include discrete graphics or not. Do you have discrete graphics on yours? Oh, uh, who knows? I don't. Think, I, who plays don't. video games on a Mac? Uh, it's not just for video games. Oh, it's for rendering. Rendering what? You know, you could, you could have. Oh, you mean like, like rendering video? Yeah, yeah. rendering. Or no, or not just rendering video, but also like if you do Cinema 4D, if you do Maya work on your MacBook Pro. Yeah, some people do that. I guess they do. Yeah, yeah. you know, Nvidia has different drivers now for whether you want to do games or studio work. No. Yes. Like desktop drivers. Yes, and they say like if you use these new drivers with uh, Blender or you know other 3D. Um, studio apps that you actually get like 6x the, the performance. What? Yeah. Go figure. Why not just have one package and, and no application specifically what you're using and then, you know, I switch. like your thinking. I do like your thinking. What inhibits? I, I have no idea. It has to be done at the driver level. Like there must have been some techie engineers there that said, you know, we can do this, but we got to make a different build. Can we do it, sir? And then like the corporation met and they said, let's try it. I wonder if it's a competing department. Like, we made the better driver set. Right, I like it. We made it, no, well, why yeah. don't we release both and see which one gets downloaded mm -hmm. more? Nah, I don't, that's, that's not how it works. That's not how, that's not how driver works. I'm, I'm curious. If anyone knows, love to hear. Yeah. Uh, Apple, uh, sticking with Apple, they had to, um, they had to give a settlement, a $500 million settlement from a class action lawsuit. Even my 13 over, year old's like in on this. He wants his $25. Yeah, over the decision to throttle performance based on battery degradation. So uh, we've talked about this before. Um, in iOS software, uh, over time, as your battery got worse, Apple decided to throttle performance as opposed to letting your battery overheat. Uh, and some people didn't want that. And so you can get up to $25 for each iPhone owned. Yeah, and Apple actually backed off on that. They allowed you to unthrottle oh, your yes. phones. Yeah, yeah. Pretty soon after this came out. Yes. I wonder if, if that, was a, that was a bad for them. You know, if that led, if that was used as evidence in the lawsuit that they had done wrongdoing. I don't know the, the yeah. legal aspect and how, how that case went. I also know that they also, in addition to letting people not throw their phones, they're not completely upfront with the fact that batteries are consumable now mm -hmm. and that there are programs built in place for you to replace your battery if you want to go through that inconvenience and pay Apple or a certified a repair center to do that because Apple would rather you just swap out the phone and buy a new phone. Yes. Yeah, but replace the battery. Uh, how do you find out if you're eligible? Um, that's a good question. I, I, I don't know. Um, I, they usually have a, do you have to type in a serial number? Cause I, who, who would know their old serial number? You must be able to just say I bought one and be able to show a receipt. Yeah. And, and, and yes. Uh, but there's gotta be a website. Once website gets launched up for people to start following their claims, we'll, we'll share that. But up to $25, um, you could claim per, per phone. I want my $25. You're going to do it? Yeah. $25 is $25. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, there's a rumor out there in Apple world that Apple will be making a smart keyboard for the next iPad that will have a built-in trackpad. A smart keyboard with a built-in trackpad. For the iPhone, basically, or for the iPad. Turning the iPad into essentially... It doesn't have more, that right now? No, you can buy the... the iPad cover yeah. and has the keyboard, but no trackpad. No trackpad, eh? No, I mean, trackpad support right now. I guess it's pretty limited. It's accessibility. Yeah. It's not, a, it's, it's not very uh, user-facing. Mm -hmm. Well, there it, it is. They're turning the iPad into that laptop. More I don't and want, more. I don't, do you want a cursor on your iPad? Do you ever feel like you need the cursor? Is, is touching the, the screen and dragging not good enough? You do get a cursor, like in a text thing like in notes if you hold down spacebar and then you move the cursor but around. you can use that with arrow key 
or the, the arrow keys to, to move that around. Dude, using a touch screen to move that thing around is fantastic. Yeah. yeah I wouldn't want to use the arrow keys. No, I'm, I'm just saying like the, 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 t- the iPad itself is a touch screen. Yes. So did you, why do you need a trackpad? You know, convenience. If I'm down here at the keyboard, I just stay down there. I don't think get fingerprints on my screen. I don't know. Seems like a good idea to me. Do you think it speaks to more mouse-like functionality, though? I think it opens the floodgates to uh, different types of <laughs> some confusion yeah. for some application that may be optimized for these things. Mm-hmm. They have the pencil. What about the, the Adobe apps? Do they support mouse? But for uh, those Adobe apps, you have the pencil. I mean, like, I can't imagine cur- uh, like active mouse support on an iPad application to feel as good as it is on a, a desktop class system. Right. A laptop. But what's holding, OS. is there anything technically holding iOS, the iPad Pro, back from running OS ten apps? Yeah. The ones on ARM and ones on x86. That's, you can't, you don't think that Apple solved that internally? I mean, they, they would be going the other way. They would yeah. be trying to get, uh, Yes, but they're completely different user interfaces. Like I, you don't you don't yes. want, you don't want Photoshop on on but, iPad the same way you use Photoshop on on your desktop. But I'm just I'm waiting for one of these two uh, products, either iPad or the PC, to start supporting the other ecosystem because it just seems so obvious to me that you could do that and open up a whole world of software. You want to use iPad applications on your desktop on your MacBook? I don't see why not. As long I mean, you would need touchscreens. And they, they won't give you touch screens I on those MacBooks. Exactly. But that's what it would, like, they could certainly do it in a heartbeat if they wanted to. This is what makes the move from Intel to ARM on the Mac OS side, on MacBooks and iMacs and Mac Pros, seem like such a big challenge. Like... Which, is that still a rumor? That's, that's the rumors that's going to happen yeah. next year. That you're going to see the first MacBooks. And we, I think Sean and I talked about this. Uh, if they do it, would it be across the entire line? Or would it just be like an end? Would they segment, you know, the entry level MacBooks would have, it would be, you know, the, the Chromebook style that's used ARM mm-hmm. with compatibility? Or would, it, would you, would someone be buying a $4,000 16 inch MacBook Pro and not get full functionality on day one because developers are still scrambling to port? The, the, the applications and yeah. you're never going to get support for some legacy applications. Right. Yeah. That's, that's a, a big challenge for Apple. And then the argument that, Oh, if they got arm working on their MacBooks, the fact that you could run then iPad applications with a cursor, that's not a, that's, that's, that's such a Google way of thinking about things as a crutch to say, now you have, you know, these millions of iPad apps mm-hmm. on your MacBook. That's, that's not, a good solution. That's, okay. That's, that's not a value add. If you say so. Me. I don't think I need the touch track, trackpad on the smart keyboard. Yeah, well, I'm just saying, what does it signal? Yeah, yeah. If, if they do make it happen. Uh, Google, speaking of which, they uh, updated the Pixel phones. Lots of uh, new updates. One of which, in their software, is basically 3D touch. Which Apple got rid of. They, Apple replaced the Force Touch mm-hmm. with... It was called 3D Touch on yeah. phones. Was it? Yes. Well, they got <laughs> rid of that. They got rid of that whole sensor that, that can detect pressure sensitivity right. on the screen of the phone. And they just changed it to duration. Long press. Yeah. Right. Which kind of works. I'm down. Doesn't really work. I'm fine Makes things it. very confusing, like on the camera application. Does. The long press for... Uh, um, recording video versus for doing the uh, hmm. uh, lots of shutters, high they, shutter. They tried to make 3D Touch a, a killer feature of a new generation of phones. Oh, we, we reviewed it for the iPhone success. And then what they did was they just realized so few people were using it. Well, let's just make it back. And that was compatible. a UI problem because it wasn't clear how to use it. The best implementation of 3D Touch was on the lock screen when you would hard press a button to turn on the flashlight or quickly access the camera. You say that, but I bet most people still don't know that that was there. Like I think it was just an invisible feature, uh, and so it, what? But what they did was they made they made the feature available to everybody with long touch. With long touch, yeah, yeah. Well, for Google on the Pixel phones, as a part of this big feature drop, uh, they have 
basically their version of 3D touch. Yeah. Now, the Pixel phones don't have that sensor, don't have actual pressure sensitivity. But it's not duration. And it's it, not it is duration. A force. Yes. And the way they're m- approximating the force yeah. is how much of your how much thumb, of the thumb touches is it. actually smushed onto the screen. Yeah, it makes sense. And they train that through machine learning. Yeah, I don't know why Apple didn't do it that way. Because Apple doesn't have the machine learning resources that Google has, apparently. Is that, wow, I don't know about that, but okay. That's kind of like Night Sight. The Night Mode, mm-hmm. Night Sight on Google is still, I think, better than Night Mode on, on iOS. And they were first to market. And they are first to market, and yep. that is 100% a machine learning enabled hmm. feature. Yeah, and Google's uh, speech recognition is better, too. Yeah. If Apple had the ability to do this, they would have used this as, as the uh, replacement for 3D Touch or, or made it an option at least, uh, alongside long touch. <laughs> it's just weird to me. I, I do think that long touch is, is more, uh, I don't know, it's uh, easier to, to grok as a user, mm-hmm. for especially n- n- people who aren't terribly technical. I don't think that the idea of pressing a, a screen with varying pressure makes a whole lot of like logical sense to people because it doesn't appear to, to respond to pressure in any way that you can see or even really feel unless you incorporate those haptics. Right. But I don't think- haptic Remember the I old Motorola phone? That's where enough. You, 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 the whole screen pressed down when you press the screen? No. Yeah. It's an old Android phone. Huh. Yeah, where you, you press like- And it moved? And the whole screen dipped down just a little bit. Like, like L- a, You mean actual, a visual effect? No, like, like huh. physically okay. the screen depressed, yeah. the whole screen depressed to make it feel like you're- pushing on something. People have been trained since forever that touchscreens are just sort of like, <laughs> there's not well, a, a tap, light, light is tap. There's yes. not an analog. Like yeah. it's just, they're a tap interface. Yep. So yeah, it's a, it's a hard nut to crack. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, last bit of tech news, let's talk about Tesla cars. Uh, because of the coronavirus, it turns out that Tesla can't manufacture enough of their new computer systems that you need for full, uh, full self-driving. And, uh, so some people who've bought the new Model 3s uh, who are supposed to have the new processors in there don't get that chip. Instead, they have the first-gen chip. Uh, people have complained already, and so Tesla made a statement and said that the hardware would be upgraded free of charge later when the supply chain was back um, in operation. Um, but right now, uh, you're going to get the 2.5 chip as opposed to the 3.0 chip. What, which what, they, what does that mean? You know, they upgraded the, the, the actual hardware. They have the new 3.0 hardware inside that was going to, you need that for full self-driving. Even what, if you paid for. You what, paid. How long has that been in? Uh, since last April. Okay. I believe. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Are we, are we dialing? Oh, oh, oh. Ooh, ooh. So I'm just pre- I'm preempting. I'm Keep getting queuing, ready. Queuing up. Super uh, pro. And then the last bit of um, technology news also with Tesla. Uh, if you bought a um, uh, Model S or X um, previously to like, I think two years ago, uh, you had the old infotainment system, meaning like your, the speed of your touchscreen interface wasn't as fast as when they upgraded that processor. And you can actually upgrade that now. Wow. 2,500 bucks. <laughs> Would you pay on your Chevy to upgrade? <laughs> no. Yeah, no, no. Oh my God. That's a huge price. No, 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 no. And you lose some things. Like I think you lose like AM, FM radio and you have to replace that with streaming radio. Oh, that's funny. Yeah, but then you do get better sentry mode and you get a lot of other and more responsive touchscreen and, and, but that's, that's a, that's a I read that the, that the new seats are good. Did you read about that? They, they actually changed the Model 3 seats this year. This year? Yes. So They the, changed them the first year they came out. Oh, well, I saw a thing like what's different from 2017 to 2020. The, the seams are in a different spot. There's different, what? different support. It's supposed oh to feel God. better. Yeah, you got old seats, dude. That's okay. I got the 2018 model. I, my, this is the 2020 model. My 2017 Bolt um, was great until this year where now the 2020 Bolts have HD backup cameras. Oh, oh, the built into the uh, rear view mirror? Both the rear view mirror and the backup camera, which is like in the main console. Have you seen it in person? No. Well, then you don't know what you're missing out on. I've seen I, I you, All you know is the intellectual information that, oh. that you are now inferior. Your yes. car is inferior. Yes. And you don't even know what the benefit is. I know I want it. You, you just know. You, yes. Wow. Wow. It could, it could mean completely meaningless. Unlikely. Unlikely. This is high definition, man. Okay. <laughs> Moment 
of science. Kishore! Oh no. Hold on, we can't hear you. Speak. Hey, I'm speaking. There There he goes. Hi, Kishore. It's so nice of you to join us. Yeah, it's great to be with you, Jeremy and uh, Norm Old Sea Tan over there. What do you? What what do you call me? (laughs) Old Seats. Old seats. Because your Model Three has the old. Oh, thank you. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Uh, Maybe the old seats were only the passenger seats and and not the driver's seats. In which case, I don't care. That's what I'm going to choose to believe. How are you doing, Kishore? I'm doing well. Sorry, I can't be there. Something came up, but Um, uh, I'm excited to be here. I don't get my music, Jeremy. What's going on? What did I play? No, he played Moment Science. Maybe Kishore just couldn't hear. Oh, you couldn't hear us? Uh, Oh, funny. Did you hear us talking? You heard. I heard you talking before. I I did play the music. You're good. You're good. Okay. Do you think is there any kind of science stuff that we should talk about this week? Nothing going on, right? We talk about things being canceled is our top story, but uh, why things are canceled is why we have you dialed in. Uh, What's the state of things? Uh, So there's a few things. I'm going to do my standard qualification. You should, uh, when it comes to the coronavirus, you should get information from highly vetted sources like the CDC or the WHO. I'm adding a new level of of caveat here. Uh, I think most people should stay the fuck off Twitter for coronavirus information. I think it makes you crazier. Um, if, frankly, the WHO actually added a line on their guidelines telling people to stay off social media uh, when it comes to sources of information because it changes so rapidly. But you know, I want to say I I just told my wife to join Twitter and subscribe to Science Quiche to, <laughs> to, to find out information about coronavirus. So I will now pass on the new advice. Well, I have some other Twitter uh, people to follow. If you're really looking for I- information, um, there is a, a, a Dr. Tara Smith, who is an uh, infectious e- epidemiologist. Uh, etiology is her handle. Uh, Maya Majumdar, who is at the Harvard uh, School of Public Health, does a lot of great reporting from the public health perspective. Helen Branswell from STAT is probably one of the leading journalists who's been reporting on infectious diseases for a long time. But um, And I'll share a link that we can jam in the YouTube comments and elsewhere. Um, uh, Public health researchers have been maintaining a Twitter list of experts uh, that are curated by public health experts. Uh, and it's a really good resource if you want to deep dive. Uh, so all that being said, my first comment is that there is the single most logical phrase in all of the entire galaxy. And that's don't panic. And that's the right thing to do even now. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a few stages that we're kind of going through with the coronavirus. Um, the first stage, which, you know, if you wind back this podcast a few weeks ago, you could hear me talk about is when scientists start talking about the mathematical models. They start talking about R0 and the prevalence of the disease and the potential prevalence of the disease as as it uh, spreads across the globe. The next phase tends to be much more about testing. Uh, This is where the U.S. is right now, is how do we test as many people as possible to get a handle on who has it, how they got it, uh, and how we can contain them. Uh, For example, South Korea has been testing 10,000 people a day uh, for for coronavirus. So the testing phase is really ramping up worldwide. Um, The next phase is really a public health phase where you're really trying to trace the contacts of anyone that does test positive. You you put in place things like social distancing to kind of keep people apart. uh, And then you try to control the infection as much as possible. This is where China has been uh, for the past few weeks. Uh, And then finally, it's really about treating the patients that do have the disease. Uh, So we're going through these phases, and that's sort of the road ahead. It's not a linear process, but that sort of gives you a roadmap of where we're going. Um, I want to start with what's been commonly reported. Uh, You may have seen the WHO uh, mention that the mortality rate for this disease was 3.4%. That was an article that came out yesterday, and that 3.4% is the what's called the case fatality rate. What they do is they take the total number of deaths and they divide that by the total number of cases. So if you look on that 
Hopkins real-time map right now, there's 3,214 people that have died from the disease and 94,261 uh, cases as of this podcast. That's a, a, a CFR rate of 3.4%, which is higher than what the 2% we've been hearing. And that's because there's two different sort of numbers being thrown around. There's the case fatality rate, which is just that number. And then there's the population mortality rate, which is a prediction of if you get the disease, what are the chances of you getting sick and dying from it? Uh, and so those numbers oftentimes get confused. Um, and right now, people are focusing on that 3.4% number, but it's going to change a lot. Uh, and it's misleading for two main reasons. One is that uh, even now, we have a wide underreporting of cases worldwide, which means if we have more cases than you think, like people that have mild symptoms that never got caught or just people that are out there that never got found, that means that the denominator is going to get a lot higher. It's going to be a lot bigger than this 94,000, which means the CFR rate is going to go down. The other thing is that it's a snapshot of where we are right now, meaning that there's a bunch of people that are sick. I think there's something like 42,000 people that have recovered at this point, but that means there's still like 50 some thousand people that are classified as having the virus and are under care and under sick. Some of those people are going to die, meaning the numerator here is going to go up as well, which means that number might go up. Uh, and then uh, the CFR changes when public health interventions come into place, and it also changes when it gets into different populations. So all of this is for me to say that number doesn't mean a whole lot to you and me. Uh, so we shouldn't look if it's 3%, 4%, 2%, 1%. It really doesn't mean much, and it's going to change a lot. So monitoring that number is not worthwhile. I see on Twitter a lot of people actually trying to do the math. Like, it's, well, if it's 3.4% worldwide, that means there should be this many cases in the U.S. You can't really do that um, with the kind of accuracy we need here. Uh, the one thing that is worthwhile noting that that 3% you know, even though it'll move, is a lot of factors bigger than the 0.1% it is for the flu, uh, meaning that you should take this extremely seriously. Um, but at the same time, that number is going to change. Now, I want to talk about the U.S. specifically. So in the U.S., uh, we uh, is widely anticipated from a lot of scientists that we are widely underreporting the number of cases because we haven't been able to test enough people. Uh, and I'm going to take you into like a little bit of a detective story uh, to show you why. Uh, Jeremy, I don't know if you can put that article up on the screen next to me, uh, but I'll sort of narrate it as we go through. Um, this uh, work was done um, by Trevor Bedford, who is a computational biologist based in Seattle. Uh, and he's using something called genomic epidemiology to track the spread of the disease. So typically, the disease... Um, uh, has an incubation period of five to seven days. That means like from somebody getting exposed, they'll incubate the virus for five days before they start to get symptoms. That's a really rough estimate. Um, but they know from characterizing the virus uh, that the virus mutates about twice a month, meaning that, you know, a A or a T in its RNA sequence is going to mutate to a, a, you know, a different letter. Um, and because of that, if you scroll down, there's this sort of branched um, uh, graph, Jeremy, that you might see. Okay. Um, what they're able to do is take the open data that's been shared from China and other countries worldwide and track the mutations of that disease by putting it through these gene se sequencing. And that branched graph you see is basically the tracking of how that virus is changing over time as it goes country to country worldwide. This is an incredible graph. Uh, and this technology that they're using is fully open source. So this map is completely open source. So any scientist around the world is able to uh, contribute to it. So let's go to the US. So the first case in the US emerged around January 15th. I think it was January 21st is when the first swab took uh, happened and the CDC released results on January 24th. Fourth. And the, gene, the genomic sequence was exactly the same as a case in Wuhan. Uh, and they knew that a traveler had gone from Wuhan over to Seattle. So they're able to say, okay, this person has the same virus, uh, and we understand that. 
Uh, about two weeks later, maybe three weeks later, another case showed up in Seattle. I think it was on February 28th is when it was diagnosed. So this is not this is only a few days ago. And this is what was called community spread, meaning they didn't have an understanding of where this case came from. And they they sort of took into account potential mutations this had, and it had a 3% chance of being mutated where it came from other strains that had traveled to other countries. But it only had to go undergo one mutation from that original Wuhan case that had come to Seattle. And so they think, based on probability, that that case was somebody that was infected by that person that came from Wuhan to Seattle. And there's an intervening period of about five to six weeks where that person was sort of, quote unquote, on the loose, um, just out of sort of containment. Uh, and based on like sort of mathematical models of how that person might interact with the environment, not knowing the person at all, uh, they think that we should have somewhere between, you know, somewhere around 500 cases in the Seattle region right now wow. uh, because of that. Uh, and we're able to determine that doing this kind of detective work of of tracking the mutations through. Now, that sounds really scary, but that's actually really comforting to see because as the testing goes, if we start to see like a collapse of what the mathematical models predict and what the testing is producing, we're actually in a really good place. That means we're starting to get a handle of where this disease is in the U.S. really quickly. And then we can move into that phase of public health interventions. Do the mutations um, have anything to do with uh, the fact that some of the cases have been misdiagnosed? No, no. The, these mutations are like normal mutations that any uh, virus will go through. Got it. Uh, as it goes from host to host or just through its daily course of life. So this is all ab about that. Um, at, at this point, I think uh, my sort of suspicion, and you shouldn't take my suspicion as any sort of gospel here, is that we're going to see a, a spike in cases in the U.S. As, as testing ramps up in the next few days. And that's normal. And that's to be expected. Uh, and frankly, like it's not the fault of the uh, administration that the number of cases are going to go up. This was sort of an inevitability once we it, it sort of started spreading globally. The key is, is we are farther behind some other countries like South Korea in our ability to test a large number of people quickly. So South Korea yesterday, I said, t tested 10,000 cases. They found 300 people uh, that tested positive. But the only reason they found those 300 people is they tested 10,000 people for it. Um, and so we're going to need to see like a ramp up uh, in that kind of way to kind of get a handle of this. And are, ideally, I assume we should be testing everybody with flu-like symptoms. Is that what South Korea is doing? Yeah, flu-like symptoms that present with like certain symptoms. Uh, so not just any flu, but a flu that has like a certain kind of cough associated to it. Um, China even started using CT scans to spot the sign of pneumonia because the COVID-19 disease actually embeds slightly deeper in the lungs than a, than a typical uh, viral pneumonia might. Hmm. Um, but how it, it presents for somebody uh, that's older versus younger, uh, we don't know what that's going to look like because we can't fully extrapolate what happened in China to what's, what's happening here. The best article I read about this, and one that actually gave me a lot uh, that calmed me down was an article in Vox that one of the um, it was an interview with a member of the WHO team that went to China and examined the practices they took. I think there's been a lot of reporting about how China didn't take necessary steps. It is extraordinary what China did. And I think in a couple of years, we're going to look back at what China did and they're going to be hailed as heroes uh, because the way they approached the disease um, in containing it probably saved a lot of lives. And um, and the WHO interview kind of underscored that. And we're seeing that from a lot of uh, Asian countries right now. Now it's our turn here in the USA. Um, so I just want to end by saying, like, I'm not panicked. I'm actually, like, reasonably calm here. Um, but preparing um, and preparing smartly. Uh, as if there will be disruptions to to life coming up soon. Uh, shout out to all the health workers that are dealing with this. They're no less than heroes. There's so many stories emerging of what they're dealing with in hospitals that are overrun. 
Uh, and um, yeah, this is going to be a tough uh, next few months. That's the only way to sort of put it. I wish I could put like a more positive spin on this, um, but I'm not panicked, but I'm also realistic about where we are. All righty. Well, thank you. Sure. Yeah. That was, that was a lot more than, uh, than I thought we'd get, but that's actually makes me feel much better. How, how's everything else? <laughs> yeah, you should feel be- much better. <laughs> hey, Kishore, uh, when you uh, disconnect, you can go look at pictures of the new Batmobile that Matt Reeves just tweeted out. So uh, I saw it. I thought, hey, I'm, I'm mostly on board. I'm less on board with the suit than I am with the Batmobile. Where did you come down, Norm? Uh, I literally just saw the picture pop up, and I like it. I like it. It looks very uh, g- uh, appropriate for early Batman for the f- first couple of years of the uh, crime fighting. All right. Well, I'll let you get to VR. I heard there's some game coming out in a couple of weeks that you're probably talking about. Um, but even though we're on video chat, I'm still going to wash my hands now. So uh, I'll see you. All right. All right. F- fist bump. All right. <laughs> Elbow. See you. <laughs> see you later, Kishore. See you, Kishore. Bye. All righty. And literally just as uh, we were talking to Kishore, uh, news broke that not only um, there are new pictures of the Batmobile, that's the movie that's being filmed right now, but uh, the new James Bond film, which was slated for release in early April, yeah. has now been pushed to November. Okay. Because of coronavirus concerns. What? Yes. What? A- yeah. You mean people going to theaters? They're afraid people will stop going to theaters. That actually brings up a good point. I was I was talking to my family about this. I wonder what business models are on the verge of extinction anyway. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if this will just push them over the edge. And movie theaters is one of them. I don't think extinction, but it definitely will impact the business for sure. The movie theaters still make so much. I mean, that for Hollywood, mm-hmm. they make so much money. And, and uh, Are you sure about that? I, I know that Hollywood makes money. And they need it. And uh, Hollywood will prop up that business model. To, to ensure that I they're wonder. still making money. I wonder. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you're right. Maybe they're just keeping them on life support and, and keeping their, their revenues as, just as low as they can, but enough to keep them alive. And theaters are doing all right with the food sales. It's one of the very few places, including you know theme parks, where people are okay paying right. exorbitant amounts of money for things that cost n- very little. Well, know, $6 for soda in San Francisco. I don't know, man. I bet you're going to see theaters close this summer because of this. Yeah. And right. an- another one, the mall. Wouldn't be surprised to see some the malls definitely, start to definitely do some. Low, I mean, yeah. Nancy Pelosi just came here to San Francisco to go to Chinatown to demonstrate that it's okay, tourists. We need to get back, you know, start spending your money again. Yeah. Um. So yeah, it's a scary time. For there me. will be a reckoning for yeah. sure. Yes. <laughs> Okay, before we talk about Half-Life Alex, I'll give uh, one story. Uh, or this past uh, Monday, I was able to go check out the new Void location in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. And we've been waiting for this to open. It's in the Westfield Mall in downtown San Francisco. Uh, for a long time, there are Void locations now in what Las Vegas, uh, downtown Disney in Anaheim, oh, uh, Disney Springs in Florida, New York has one, and uh, this is the, the the big LBE for VR with... Uh, location-based experience. Location-based experience with um, interactive VR where they build out physical rooms that you, and then things that you can touch while you're in headset. You're wearing a, you know, a backpack essentially with a haptic uh, vest. I think most feel. people who listen to this segment know what the void no, is. Just, just for, for those who don't, like it really is one of the best VR experiences you can have right now. It's only one of the best first VR experiences yeah, you can have. Because it, it does what the home environment can't do, which is make virtual reality tactile touchable yes and you're you don't have, one of the decisions they made is that you don't hold controllers uh well it, it uses you, you, pick you pick up pick up controllers yeah. you pick up these the weapons yeah, weapons like exactly. that feel like rifles yep, yep. yeah uh but by nature they use uh by default they use uh leap motion sensors tracking, yeah and they you get hand tracking when you put your hands in front of you so the experience i did was the relatively new one launched last fall the avengers um there's a name for it i forget what it is uh it's not a canonical mcu story but it is set in the mcu 
Mm-hmm. Avengers Damage Control. Okay. So uh, they use actors, they use characters from the MCU. It's just not tied to one of the, the storylines. Uh, I won't spoil what happens here, but you asked me before, because you didn't get a chance to do this, of how did it compare to the Star Wars Secrets of the Empire? Which is the only Void experience I've done. And they, they have a bunch out now, right? There's a Jumanji one, uh, there's a Wreck-It Ralph one, uh, they have their own um, kind of uh, Lovecraftian horror one. Nicodemus. Yes. Nicodemus. And, Nicodemus. Nicodemus. Uh, the Avengers one surprised me, because if you look at the image, mm-hmm. uh, then you watch the trailer, they, there's like a YouTube video. They show you in like Iron Man style suits. That makes a lot of sense, right? You're wearing a backpack, and there's yeah. a Ghostbusters one. Uh, you're wearing this backpack, so and you're wearing VR headset. So of course they can put up Iron Man style HUDs, and you put your hands in front of you. You can do you know repulsor rays. You can you can blast. Cool. Right? You're not gonna be flying or anything like Iron Man. Uh, but I thought it was just gonna be kind of like a wave based shooter where you're standing on a platform yeah. and just firing. And there are aspects of that this. 15 to 20 minute experience, which is just that, where you're just kind of standing and, and firing at robots and, right. and enemies, um, which is fun. But a big part of the void is, other people. is natural loco- other people. locomotion, where you're actually walking around a space. And there is that as well. I, okay. More of that in this than I thought. Uh, basically, co- very comparable to the uh, Secrets of the Empire. Okay. Um, but def- a different, a very different version. Architecture? Like a different set? A different set completely. Okay. Like if you have done Secrets of Empire and you kind of like have a sense in your head of where you walked and how far you walked, right. uh, they do things very differently here, is all I'll say. Why, why is that all you're going to say? Because I don't want to spoil the experience. But what do you mean? Is it, uh, is it a larger space? No, it's not a larger space. Do you move more frequently? Do you no, backtrack no, a lot? It, it is very much a Disney ride style thing where hmm. you are, there's action and then storytelling and action and storytelling. Right, okay. And in between that, you do do some walking. They're never, you, they're never, they can't, by design, give you a space to run in. They don't want oh, people no. to run. That's bad. Right, it's corridors. Yeah. It's, um, they do some fake elevation stuff where you feel like you are either on an elevator or you feel like you're walking up or down a ramp, yeah. but you're really not. They, and it's just, uh, it's, it's it's just in your head. Do they do the, the heat uh, lamp kind of There's thing? There's definitely the heat lamp type yeah. of thing for environmental, um, mm-hmm. we'll call them atmospheric effects. Okay, let's call it that, yeah. And uh, in Avengers, you know, there, there are portals. You know, so there's, there's Doctor <gasps> Strange like portals. So that's another way that they can have you traverse wow. through that world uh, without you actually having to Iron Man fly through the world. So one of the best parts of Secrets, what is it, Secrets of the Empire? Secrets of the Empire. Is uh, the cooperative moment where you kind of, ha- some people have to help you take out the enemies while the other person's solving a puzzle. Yes. Is there that kind of thing? There's definitely a cooperative moment where one person's doing one thing and another person's doing another thing. Okay. For sure. Sounds good. Um, is it a four person experience? It is four, up to four people. And yeah, we play with three people and we can tell the places where it was designed uh, to maximize for four people. Yeah. Uh, but where they fill in the gaps and one of the characters will know how many people we're playing with and will say, the three of you are here well, as opposed to the four of you are here. High budget experience. Yeah, yeah they, they did four different vocal recordings <laughs> for that one. Did they use any Hollywood actors? Yes. Okay. Yes. You, you will see familiar faces and characters. Cool. More so than I expected. Because <laughs> I thought it was just going to be you know, one or two. But it, it definitely feels like an Avengers in Star Wars, Experience. I think there's one actor in as part of the introductory video. Yes, they're very similar here in terms of that. Okay. Yeah, yeah. In terms of the video they paid, they play for the the onboarding. Uh, for that one, it was um, Diego Rivera. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, from, from Rogue, Rogue one. one. Yeah. And for here, it's Shiri from uh, Infinity, oh neat and Black Panther. Yeah. And Infinity War. Uh, so. We're going to do more coverage on this. I'm trying to see if I can get some kind of behind the scenes look on how they run this uh, facility I, and how they designed it. I want to know about what the set looks like and yeah. I want to know about how they transition because it appears to me that they only run Star Wars on odd days and then they run Avengers on even no, days. No, no, no. Uh, it's, it's not. Um, they, so really? uh, the one at least in San Francisco, it's two full setups. Right, but they have four experiences. And they s- rotate on a schedule, but it's not like every other day. It's okay. on like a multiple week basis. So they'll do like two week engagement with this, huh. then a multiple week engagement with that. It's not exactly that interval, but it's not a every other day type turnover. It's like, well, they'll need like a, 
a full day of breakdown and reset up. Well, that's my question. I want to see what that process yeah. take, you know, looks like. Well, it's 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 definitely less complex than resetting up a Disney ride for sure. Absolutely. But I'm sure walls are being moved mm-hmm. and like heat lamps are being moved. And what is their stuff. thinking about how to make that faster? You know, because they must want to make that as much. Do mod- they need to make that faster? I would think so. I would think that they would want that that be as modular as possible. I think from a business that, standpoint, they got to figure out what the the uh, walk-in model is. If it's all walk-ins and it's all new people, like the one in downtown Disney, right outside Disneyland, you're going to have a high interest in Star Wars. Yeah. Right? right. And so they could run Star Wars forever there. Probably Wreck-It Ralph. And, and Wreck-It Ralph. They could run Star Wars and Wreck-It Ralph forever there and they'd be fine. Or Avengers, right? You say that, but I mean, you know that there's people that want to do a, a a game that they don't have running right now and yes. they would walk away. And so if they could press a button and have robots move all the pieces where oh they my, need to go. That would be so expensive. Yes. But that would not be, it would not be economically beneficial then, I mean, it's like a Broadway performance, right? Like, well, there's no robot that's going to change from Hamilton to, look, you know, uh, to Matilda because I want to see Matilda one night and Hamilton the other night. You just got to work with the schedule. Part of the appeal of this experience is that the world is actually much less elaborate than you think it is. Because, the virtual aspect. Yeah, yes. because what you see is... Um, you can reach out and touch it, but it doesn't actually have to physically yeah. embody the thing yeah. that you're looking at. It can be two by fours and it can look like, you know, something yeah. much more expensive than yeah. that. It can be unpainted. Mm-hmm. And so all of this, all these elements, like they lend themselves to rapid change and, de- and deployment. So well, the, the, but the more complexity you have right. in the tangibility, mm-hmm. that there's a, a point in which that there's diminishing returns for that because you're only getting 15 to 20 minutes of engagement per, yeah. per group, right? I'm not going to be touching every single wall and every panel. I don't need like two dozen different sights and sounds and smells and, 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 and atmospheric effects. You know, a few of those will work. So there's definitely a sweet spot for that. I, I agree. Uh, at the same time, you know, they could dumb it down and say every one of these experiences has maybe the same layout. We're going to go for a big area to a small what, area to a big area. Don't want. And that's what you don't want. And so I think in terms of from the Void's perspective, they got to design things where they have a modular set. They have Lego blocks, essentially. Right. X number of walls, X number of effects. And they know that from a business standpoint, it's only going to make sense to have this number of trend, elements that are different. You know, they have this number of elevator style vibrating floor pads, right? And every experience will have one of those. And then they choose where in the experience that is. And they can't go completely Look, wild in terms of the design. I was joking about the robots. Okay? I, I know. I'm just joking about that. But if they did have, the, I, I'm not, I imagine that they could put things on rails, that they could be hooks, that it could be oh, l- optimizations. basically sure. big Lego pieces. Yeah. That, and, but they have, so they have this set of parts that they can put to use that they know that they'll have on every set. Mm-hmm. And, but then that could be changed much more rapidly. I can't imagine they don't want that. Because that would just mean more business. And if they were a ride inside Disneyland where they're guaranteed of tens of thousands of people yeah. going through and waiting in line, then that would make so much sense. But at this point, I think they just want people to try it. Yeah. They just want people to to go there and try VR. And for the vast majority of people trying it, I bet it's going to be their only time going to the void. You know, there might there may be two two experiences, right? Because they're not cheap. It's forty dollars a person for like what 15, 20 minutes for fifteen twenty minutes yeah. of this stuff. And and the, there's one that's twenty dollars, the the Nicodemus one. Um, and and that may be a licensing thing. You know, Disney needs their cut too, as well. Uh, I wish they did two for one. You know, group group package or something. Yeah, right. Some type of group. I, this it's ripe for Groupons. These things are absolutely ripe for Groupons. Yeah. The the thing that they're competing with really isn't theme parks. It's escape rooms. Yeah, escape rooms take a lot longer. Escape rooms take a lot longer, and they cost out the same as if you uh, get a group. If you get a group, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, if anything, I would like for them to go for longer experiences. And, and yes, it's more expensive to design for. Yeah, uh, and and maybe VR is less conducive to that because you're wearing a backpack and you have a headset on the whole time, but. Like that's where I would love for this to get toward a an hour long, the hour Assassin's and a half Creed. long. You never did the one. Assassin's Creed one. I did. Dude. I did that one. That was longer yeah. than Voyage. Yes, that was considerably yeah. longer. And but that one was just in a standard uh, VR arcade where you just needed one room scale thing. Yes. Yeah, it's very different than the Void in that sense, but it was co-op and it was it was definitely uh, an es- a virtual escape room. That one was one where if they had sold it 
just over steam to people, it would have technically worked. But the production value and the they wanted everyone to have a set number amount of space to walk in right. meant that they wanted to make an LBE. Yeah. Companies are still figuring out the business models. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the void is a very flashy uh, a setup because they have investment and and there's a big wow factor there, uh, and they have the, the brands. Like it's the only place. I think the Star Wars ones, people are. It's a great experience, and and people are happy to pay for it. It is now. I just don't know what that means a year or two from now. You mm -hmm. need to follow up. You know, and people are aren't going to be paying for Endgame two years after Endgame comes out. Comes out. You need another. You need another one. Really, I, I feel like they do have this follow up in the in the form of Wreck It Ralph and and the uh, Avengers. I mean, I, I intend to go to go play the Avengers one as soon as yeah. as I can. Yeah, uh, I, I I think that they would be wise to have another Star Wars one. Then they can use the uh, same props. Yes, right, <laughs> right, or some of the same props. Yep. Yeah, you should play as the bad guys. Oh, that would be cool. That would be cool. Dark forces. Mm -hmm. Dark forces. The void. Yeah. Okay. Half Life Alex. It's coming out in what? Oh my gosh. Two and a half weeks now? 23rd, right? March 23rd. And this week we saw more, oh, more video than ever. We had 19 minutes of new footage, 10 <laughs> of them from Valve, nine of them from IGN. Yeah. Uh, and if you've probably watched this now, but let's talk about it. So three videos from three different parts of the game, each showing a different locomotion. The first two mechanic. feel very similar. Like, I guess it's all from the early part of the game. I, it seems like they, they I, about, or IGN said the first 10 minutes, but I, I got the sense that it was more like chapter two, but still early in the game. Oh, they're definitely not from the first, like first, first 10 minutes of the game. Right. I, I can confirm that. Okay. Uh, the one where the first video, video number one from Valve, where you're going through the subway yeah. train, we had some of that we showed in our video from December. Mm -hmm. And that I can confirm is early on in the mm -hmm. game. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of the stuff, it seems like the enemies are very low level. Like they're just zombies. They're just people, head crabs on top of zombies. Yeah, they're getting gamers accustomed to yes. the world. Right. And the rules of the world. Yeah. But part of what I saw for the first time was, uh, some of the weapon upgrade uh, functionality. Yes, yes, yes. So there's an upgrade station. That upgrade station just looks cool. Like the animations uh, on it. When you see it come to life, you're like, Valve, you're back. That is awesome. The animations for that and also the uh, the HEV, the health mounted thing, the, the health station where you put in right. the slug, you put your hand down. Yeah. All the animations are top notch. Yeah. And that's something in VR you get a lot of bang for your buck out of they because do, it's, it's all three they play a psychological trick with that because they have a bunch of needles that come out and poke your hand and you i know if you're in vr that's gonna feel like ah it doesn't i, I mean for the first time maybe, maybe you don't think so i mean maybe for, for new people yeah. maybe I, I think that that's why they do it though oh, because they want no haptics if they're haptic gloves they want to be a you, perfect place they want to make you feel like you're gonna get a poke yeah yeah Oh, uh, what, what I saw okay. uh, also was uh, the sight that they equipped yes. the, the pistol whip yes. with. And uh, that looks awesome because, you, you, I mean, if you think about it, you get it from the video, but you, you know that's going to just feel right in VR because there's a perspective you need to get, as with any sight, where things align and you can then see through and, and you can tell that the depth is just going to look awesome. Well, in you VR. can also tell that on that site, and this is not a, a zoom site, this is a, like a red dot site. Right. Uh, the way they have it mounted on the pistol is layers of panels, mm -hmm. which tells you when you want, you want to align them, you have to align the panels, which is something you would have to do anyway. But visually it tells you that you get extra benefit for that. And I don't know if you noticed in the video, when you then hover that site over an enemy, you get to identify the weak spots. Right. Because they glow they orange. Glow. And yeah. there are uh, there were weak spots I wouldn't have noticed on the zombies mm -hmm. on, the, on their legs because it's whatever. dark, a dark environment. It's really cool. Yeah. And then there's the whole unlocking mechanic, which is you you know that they're thinking, what could we do in VR that really you just could? I talk about the, the puzzles. Yeah, you couldn't the spatial puzzles. Couldn't do it with the gamepad in any yeah. reasonable way. And that's where they're actually in three dimensions doing something totally novel, where they're moving these orbs around this sphere and aligning these lines in three dimensions, which. Actually, I think it's going to be the kind of thing you have to see in VR to really get because in two dimensions, it looks confusing, but it, it'll, I think it'll make it's a, like lot, a mini game in itself. A lot of sense in 3D. Yeah. And, and I think I don't think that's the only mini game, only puzzle. I think that their approach to designing puzzles is all kind of this two handed hmm. interaction with 3D space yeah. to take advantage of VR. Uh, and, um, 
That's all I, as I can say. Uh, it was great to see the IGN video transition from teleport to smooth locomotion. It even show you the menu. Yeah, you could, we you could see adjust the, the turn uh, degrees. You get to uh, their uh, ladders. You actually get to climb up the ladders with your hands, or mm -hmm. if you just want to teleport up the ladder, the option is there as a toggle. It's great. Uh, what did you think about the combat? Uh, well, really, the the video to watch for that is the third. Uh, game per, gameplay trailer where you're actually up against the combine soldiers mm -hmm. and uh, it looks fantastic. I mean, you got like soldiers coming at you. The guy opens a door to act as a defensive shield and then like firing blindly around and it just looks what we've been wanting for, waiting for. Uh, I can't wait. I can't wait. You can throw grenades, catch them, throw, throw them back. back. The gravity gloves, they got a really good sense of how you use the gravity gloves. Yeah, and I, I even feel like at one point, maybe in IGN's video, he flicked it and missed it, which makes me feel good. I feel like there's, there's like, like, a, like you need to grab it when it comes to you. You do need to grab it when it comes to you. Yeah, that's awesome. Yes. Uh, the footage is fantastic. Um, IGN has a, a more continuous playthrough of that early subway level. I think what we're showing right now is that puzzle, Jeremy, you're talking about. Uh, there were a couple. There was one for the to activate the actual um, upgrade machine itself. Yes, yeah. and you saw the the whole resin thing. You're collecting these these resin pieces. Oh, I, that's, I'm glad you mentioned that because world. it reminded me of the, the, the voice. You have a, somebody who's helping you. Russell. Russell's telling you about the world. And, I, you know, Gabe has, has said in the past that he thinks Valve's best game is Portal 2. Mm. And uh, I feel like they're taking a little bit of Portal and bringing it into Half-Life. Oh, for sure, the humor. Yeah. And it, it, is there. Yeah, well, it, it seems like, is the, was the guy who did the voice from New Zealand in... Uh, in Portal 2. It's not, uh, yes. It's a different guy. Different, different but guy. it's the yeah. same kind of sense of humor and the same vibe. Yeah. And I, I, I'm, I can't wait because that, that is one of the best things about Portal. The levity yeah. is needed between the moments of intensity and, you know, and horror, you know, frankly, because Half-Life games have traditionally been pretty, some pretty scary, yeah. pretty ominous, right? Uh, and the, and graf the graphics here are beyond what I expected. Oh, good, good. That was, I think a lot of people's takeaways also watching this was like, Wow, the fidelity of art. If this was just released for... Uh, <laughs> Which a lot of people for, hope it will be. I know, for, for, <laughs> for PC or for console, yeah. it would be AAA yeah. in itself. But as you and I know, for VR, you, you need that high fidelity of art if you're trying to create this type of AAA experience. It's interesting you say that because I was going to say uh, you need to manage your resources because you have to hit 90 frames a second uh, in, in stereo. Well, system requirements are, are not low, right? A, a lot right. of memory needed, a lot of VRAM... Uh, for these assets, uh, physics objects as well. Um, it, it's not Boneworks, right? It's not right. everything is physics object, but there are plenty of things to um, that you manipulate. Uh, the, the funny thing is the videos are on a playlist, right? And as I was watching them, mm -hmm. they went by one, it went by very quickly because the, the 10 minutes of footage uh, felt like four minutes to me. I was just immersed <laughs> in the content. Yeah. And at the by the end of the third video, I was like, Oh shoot, did I miss the one where they did smooth locomotion? And I watched the entire second video not cognizant of the fact that they changed the locomotion. Oh, in the official video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like it just it didn't it didn't register. Mm -hmm. It was just I was just watching yeah. content. Yeah. In some ways, it's a little bit cutscene like because you're watching what looks like a trailer. Well, I think part of what lends it to that is also the cinematography. Mm. I think that they're running camera smoothing. I've I've never seen VR head movement look this smooth, and it really does ease in and out of positions. The, it's either highly measured or there is right. some type of post-processing done. But even the IGN video, it, it felt smooth. I don't think the IGN video was IGN Ryan's playing. IGN playing. Okay. I think that was given. I, I, I don't know knowledge of this, yeah. but my suspicion based on having played those levels right. and knowing how people in VR play... Right, like I, I think you're right. If you, anyone who's played VR, a shooter or anything, and has uh, and, and has captured that footage, um, one, it looks jittery because yeah. your head naturally does some movement, and a lot of people don't like watching it, which yeah. is why they do. Yes. If they did it, yes. why they and, why and, they and, and it's not a fault or anything. This no. is what they need to do to communicate the experience. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you have a Valve Index, I think by the time you listen to this, Valve should have dropped two environments for Steam Home that are based in Alex. So you're downloading 
I think Alice, Alex assets. Whoa. So you know the the val the steam home environment. I'm familiar with it. Right? Uh that that courtyard area, that, that little house area. Yeah. I think you'll have a version of that that is set in the world of Alex that you can then start looking at the fidelity of objects. I'd like that. I think it's supposed to be released on Wednesday. Today? Today. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Well, you know, yesterday. Right. You're listening to the podcast on Thursday. Uh and um what else I was going to say? Oh, and of course, uh, you know, we were there in December and I did some interviews up there and uh, that re- video should be released today as well. <laughs> so uh, there's a deep dive, a half hour conversation with Robin Walker and Greg Coomer over at Valve about designing Alex for VR and the some of the problems they had to solve and the things they learned making Alex. Uh, no spoilers for content, for game, uh, for, for, um, for story. In that video, yeah. so I know a lot of people are spoiler reverse, uh, but I think it's a really interesting conversation. So is Valve. Yes. Yeah. Is there anything in these trailers that was a surprise to you? Uh, I mean, I not played two of the segments. Oh wow! Like the, two, the video two and video three were from parts of the game that I had not played yet. Oh wow! Yeah. Only so I don't I don't know if those are early on in the game because right, I played right, right. a couple hours and I didn't experience those parts yet. All right. So that. That's the most I, I guess I could say. The one thing, the one thing that I, that stood out to me. What, yeah, what, yep, yep. what are those creatures that are up barnacles. there? Barnacles. Yeah. The, they, barnacles. they have said before that the barnacles won't lift you up. Yes. And they purposely didn't even show what happens when you touch one. They did. No. Uh, they, maybe the Aijin one did. I don't think so. They shoot them. They send other things. They throw things at them. No, then, there's they, definitely one where you walk underneath it and then you see it getting Alex getting damaged. So is that what happens? That's what happens. You don't get like a third person camera no, of Alex. No, you up. just start getting damaged. That doesn't make sense. I mean, raise me up. No, it's very uncomfortable. What happens then if you shoot it? You get dropped? Yes. <laughs> Make it an option. Hey, if it's modable, which it will be. Yeah. All right. Do you want to be, you want to have something drop you? Are you kidding? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Before we're playing someone else's video now. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, that's Half Life Alex um, out in just two and a half weeks. Uh, speaking of Steam, Steam uh, VR Home got completely redesigned. Big update to that. Uh, it's no longer just the uh, big screen, not big screen, uh, big, uh, the TV mode, the okay. f- uh, big picture mode. It's not. It's not big picture mode. If you can Steam VR, it is it, the interface. Yeah. It actually looks a little more like Oculus Home. The whole yeah. new thing, huh? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, lots of shortcuts to um, uh, rendering quality, so you can actually change rendering resolution from within the menu now. Do you have to enable a beta mode or anything? No, or it's, it's just live. Thing. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's Steam VR version one point one. Okay. Is what they're calling it, uh, but it, it it makes getting into they said the dashboard is completely new and the launcher is new, so but it makes getting into the content easier. Uh, it makes configuring controls easier. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's just an overall feels more native VR interface than just grafting the, uh, the, uh, the, t- uh, big screen, uh, the, again, yeah. big picture mode big picture. In, into VR. Okay. Yeah. So when you're in a game and you pull up the system menu, you mm-hmm. now get this. Now you get this. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that does it for this episode. It does? Okay. I think so. Great. Yeah. All right. Yeah. We're not going to, unfortunately. It's my fault. We're not going to talk about Picard this week. We're going to do a big Picard catch up next week. Crossing fingers. Sure, we'll be here, or at least we'll be able to talk about it. <laughs> Jeremy, you got episodes to catch up on? I'm a little behind. I'm a little behind. I've been busy, but I would love to watch it. I'm going to watch it. Uh, episode seven is n- coming out this week, which we'll talk about next week. It's the one I'm looking forward to the most. But you've been saying, you've been saying that it's not your favorite Star Trek show ever made. No, far from it. No, oh. it's far from next gen. Okay. It's, it's not even, it's not even as good as first contact, the movie. And I love first contact, the movie. So that's a high bar. Yeah. But it's not, we're, we're going to go re- address this once the season is over. 10 episodes are done. Okay. I'm going to kind of recap the entire series. Uh, and, and there will be a season two. Certainly it's... But it's vi- not what I... I'm, I'm reconciling what it is. Certainly like visually, cinematography, it, it's the highest budget. It's sure. like the most film sure. It's the... Undoubtedly. The, okay. Okay. Production values. Yeah. Is, the money's on the screen. It's just that the story they wanted to tell isn't the story 
I wanted to see. You've never seen a serialized Star Trek TV show like this, have you? DS9 was serialized. Was it and as much as this? Not as much as this, but okay. they were like four episode arcs, season long storylines. Okay. You know, some of the best Star Trek, uh, and even things like the Orville, have standalone episodes where episodes have, you know, their own arcs and lessons learned and uh, feel like little parables for yeah. what science fiction is, but then also tie into the backdrop of a season long right. story. Yeah. Uh, I don't need that from Picard because Picard, I'm fine with it being serialized. I mean, that's not what I don't like about it. It's the pessimism. It's the cynicism. It's the defeatedness of Picard. I get that's what where the character is yeah. right now in his point in his life and career and right. retired. We're, well, you're in the middle though. You got to wait, you got to come out the darkness on the other end by episode 10, right? And I, I, I do think, I, I know there's arguments against fan service and they're doing a really good amount of fan service. There are lots of deep dives you can do with the characters and the technologies and the aliens that they mention. I just wish they took some of the great hooks from Next Generation. I'm going back to the chase that one of my favorite episodes and they could have things like the Borg and they could have things like data, uh, you know, the legacy of data and the legacy of Picard. And I don't need the original crew, but the themes that they set up and these kind of mysteries they left lingering from next generation. I wish they explored those more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to lay out what I wish the season was at the end of the season. Okay. Well, well, why don't you watch the whole season? First? I will. I will. Okay. That's what I'm going to do. I'll watch the whole season first. <laughs> We're going to talk about it. And then as an aside, I'm going to lay out what I wish Picard was. Great. I'm sure you'll be hired to work on season two. Well, that's, that's my pitch. All right. <laughs> Someone get Michael Shea on the phone. Um, anything you want to talk about before we close the show? That's it. All right. That's it. I think Will Hawk is back. Unless you played it last week. It's, how long is this one? Is this one a five minute one? We played a really long one last week. Five minutes. Uh, this is two minutes, 40 seconds. Yeah, it's pretty long. We might have played this one last week. Is it called Cuts on the Push? <laughs> yeah, we played this one last oh, well. week. It's, it's okay. a pretty good one. Well, let me Let's go, go with the classic. Let's let go, go with the archives then. Um, let's see. If, it's not like uh, your website where there's a thousand pages. <laughs> there's only 11 or 12. Here we go. Jeremy Jobs from three years ago. Justin, a.k.a. Speed. Hi there. I didn't see you. Test it. Walk around the house like this, like holding your chin a I little bit. I put on my Lennon glasses. Yeah, I made everyone call me Steve. That's it. All right. Bye. See you next time.